Hi. Well, after lots of comments and tons of procrastination on my part, we finally arrived. The finale. The end of our precious series. The Three Kings arc. Now, when I made the Chapter Black video and I said I wasn't going to be making a video essay on this particular arc, I genuinely meant that at the time. I had zero intention of revisiting the Three Kings arc for a full-scale analysis, especially considering how much time and effort go into videos of this type. But then the comments started to come in with people that were either disappointed that I had chosen not to discuss this arc, or people that had similar opinions to mine that wanted to see me go into more detail about my grievances. The more I thought about it, the more it felt like something I needed to do, especially because you guys are the reason I even make content to begin with. You're all the reason that my previous two video essays on this show are far and away my best performing, and I feel like I owe it to you guys to cap this series off with a proper video. If you're new here, welcome to the party! My name is Saturn, a professional dumpster fire whose upload schedule is about as consistent as a McDonald's ice cream machine. Before we dive in, a few things. First and foremost, thanks for watching. I know I usually place this at the end of videos, but I wanted to say so a bit earlier to show my gratitude. So if you're here, you are appreciated. Second, to keep up to date with what videos I've planned, what's next on the itinerary, or just chill with like-minded people, come on over to the Somewhere Past Never Discord server. We're a pretty chill group. I'm the most active on Discord. I don't really use Twitter or anything, so it's the best place to reach me if you have something to say or suggest, and we'd love to have you in general. Third, if you feel so inclined to support the channel, please consider heading over to the Somewhere Past Never Patreon page like these lovely names right here. Everything helps push me towards being able to do this full time, which would mean more content for you guys on a more regular basis, especially considering that my Chapter Black and Dark Tournament videos recently got copyright claimed. Lastly, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz. Make sure you hit the bell icon so you never miss out on content when it goes up. And with all the housekeeping out of the way, I feel like it's time to talk about the demonic elephant in the room. I think it's important for me to put into perspective why I was so reluctant to tackle this arc in a video like this before we get into the meat and potatoes of the analysis. The Three Kings, just like Chapter Black, have the arduous task of following up an excellent arc with something even greater. On top of that criteria, it also had the unenviable task of having to bring the series as a whole to a close. This meant that not only did it have to tell a new, complete narrative, it also had to find ways to weave in the themes of the show along the way. A final arc is supposed to be the culmination of everything that's led to it, a grandiose display of writing prowess that feels like the logical conclusion to everything that we and the characters have endured. And to be fair, I do think that The Three Kings starts off favorably strong. Chapter Black laid the groundwork for what could have been the most compelling story arc so far that could have led to an explosive or cathartic ending. The notion of a mystery being out there, of an ancestor of Yusuke's forcing his will onto the boy, robbing him of his agency, was already intriguing enough. That alone could have carried the audience forward, whether that was with Timur and Meshia as a whole, or with Yusuke on his own. Either choice would have been fine, since Demon World wasn't really a place we'd explored before. The best way I can summarize my feelings about this arc without giving too much of the game away before we begin is that The Three Kings feels like a textbook example of wasted potential. It's an unfortunate trait that is peppered throughout the entirety of the remaining episode count. Let me just go ahead right now and clear up any potential misunderstanding and say that right up front, I don't 100% hate this arc. In fact, there are plenty of things that I did and still do enjoy about this arc that we'll get into as we move along. The positives aren't erased by the shortcomings of the arc, but to be honest, it's those same positives that make this arc so frustrating to watch. The framework for incredible storytelling is there, and it bums me out deep in my spirit to see cool ideas either get wasted completely, or implemented way too late for them to matter. Now, when we talk about rushed storytelling, we inevitably have to talk about Yoshihiro Tagashi himself, the author of the series. At the conclusion of Yu Yu Hakusho's serialization in Shonen Jump, Tagashi penned a letter to his fans explaining why he decided to end the manga. There's quite a bit to this letter, and I do encourage you to go read it in its entirety, so I'll put the link to it in the description below, but there are a few relevant passages that I want to read to you right now. If I'm being honest, I'm feeling a great relief and pleasure at the thought that I've finally been able to finish Yu Yu Hakusho. It's not that I've lost all emotional attachment to the work, but I feel that my stress levels had greatly surpassed my will to work. There were many reasons for this, all in all about 50 big and small ones, but in broad strokes, these were the major reasons. One, my body. Two, thoughts I had about what it means to draw manga. Three, desire to do other things than work. From when Yu Yu Hakusho began serialization up until the start of the Dark Tournament, I had a half a day off every week in which I caught up on sleep. My heart began to hurt every time I went without sleep, and then began to hurt more and more often. This was when I seriously started to think about the pace of production for manga. 
I don't want to die from overwork. I was never able to throw away my ideal of being able to draw manga without help from other people. A few times during the run of Yu Yu Hakusho, I finished my manuscripts all by myself. All of these instances were when my stress levels were at their highest. Tagashi had been struggling with the crushing workload for as far back as Two Shots and Karama vs Karasu and was hitting peak exhaustion well into the start of the arc we're talking about today. In a Q&A that comes from the same document as the explanation letter, Tagashi mentions that during the fight between Yusuke and Sensui, he'd feel nauseous just sitting down to draw since he didn't want to draw manga anymore. According to him, that was the first time he'd asked editorial if he could quit. The life of a manga artist is a brutal one. There are countless articles, YouTube videos, and even a few anime about this very topic. And it's sad to know that Tagashi wanted to take the characters in a new direction as a kind of counter against the burnout he was feeling, but unsurprisingly, Jump wouldn't allow that. Jump is notoriously strict about what they allow their chosen creators to actually create. Their deadlines are ironclad, they tend to chase trends, and even if an artist is doing everything they want, if their series doesn't perform the way they want it to, it's not unusual for a series to unceremoniously disappear from Jump's pages. Imagine dealing with all of that professional pressure alongside very real and very serious health issues. I can't say that I blame Tagashi for wanting to end his story on his terms instead of being forced out of the door by corporate mannequins. However, that desire to be free is what ultimately gave us the Three Kings arc that it's finally time to dive into. This arc follows the aftermath of Chapter Black and the new revelations that came at its conclusion. Just like with my previous two video essays, we are going to be diving deep into spoiler territory for this one, so if you haven't seen the Three Kings arc, you should go check it out and then come back afterward. It runs from episode 95 through the conclusion of the series at episode 112, so it won't take you terribly long to power through it. If you do have to leave and come back though, there will be timestamps in the description below for each section of the video. The Three Kings begins in much the same fashion as Chapter Black, with Yusuke both bored with the return to the drabness of everyday life, as well as still deeply annoyed by being at the top of the perceived food chain of human world. His ancestor's intervention in his fight with Sensui left a lingering and bitter taste in his mouth that he just can't shake. We find out that Yusuke has been having the same dream over and over, being jumped by a gang of ruffians only to come out completely unscathed. On top of that, he hasn't been going to school either. Before long, he meets up with Koenma, who is dealing with the fallout of his own actions at Chapter Black's conclusion. The young ruler can't return to Spirit World for fear of execution after directly disobeying his father to protect Yusuke. The frankness of their conversation, as well as Koenma having placed his own life at risk for the detective, really shows how close the two have gotten over the span of the series. They constantly take jabs at each other, sure, but they both genuinely trust the other. Part of the two meeting up was for Koenma to warn Yusuke to remain vigilant, as he believed it was nearly guaranteed that his father would make another attempt on Yusuke's life. I like this added layer because it's one, a natural consequence of Yusuke's entire journey, and two, it shows that Yusuke has become so potentially dangerous that Spirit World has deemed it necessary to continue their plot to kill him, despite everything he's accomplished on their behalf. Yusuke confirms that his restlessness stems from the way his fight with Sensui ended, and Koenma asks if he regrets coming back to Human World instead of sticking around Demon World to find the answers he's after. Yusuke admits that he's just unsatisfied and says he's simply crying for the moon, which is a phrase that basically says that no matter what a person has, they always want what's beyond their reach. In Yusuke's case, it means that if he stays in Human World, he'll have no one left to challenge him and help him figure out who or what he really is, but on the flip side, if he goes to Demon World to seek out those answers, he'll just miss the ones he'd be leaving behind. I love Koenma's remark before Yusuke explains what he means, too. Now where's the moon come into this? It's a small thing, but it always tickles me and serves as a soft reminder that despite having watched over Human World for countless years, Koenma still doesn't have quite a solid grasp on metaphors like this one. Their discussion is so down to earth, not a boss and subordinate dynamic, but one of two friends just chatting about the impossible situations they've unfortunately found themselves in. In the end, Koenma directs Yusuke to Genkai, who he feels is most likely to help him figure out what it is he wants or needs to do. Genkai understands that underneath Yusuke's turmoil, he's really just trying to figure out a question most of us struggle with when we feel like we've peaked, plateaued, or even when we've failed. What's next? Genkai ultimately also punts Yusuke down the line to someone she thinks might be able to help him, a retired spirit detective that held the mantle before Sensui, Kuroko Sato. Genkai's hope is that Kuroko's similarity to Yusuke will be enough to find a way to help him, so off he goes. Yusuke finds himself in the boonies and eventually comes into contact with Kuroko, who, after just watching Chapter Black, looks like Sensui with titties. Longneck over here lives in the mountains with her children and husband, and to be honest, she's kind of a boring character. Anyway, we get a brief scene with Koenma talking to Genkai about her sending Yusuke to Kuroko. 
Koima says doing so was fine because he thinks they can trust her, which raises eyebrows for Genkai. Koenma clues her in about the assassination order placed on Yusuke's head and mentions that Kuroko, while being a loyal ally, was always loyal to Spirit World, so there's a non-zero chance that she may have already been contacted to take Yusuke out. Who better to take out a spirit detective than another spirit detective? It's an interesting flip from how Chapter Black went, but with Yusuke in the potential crosshairs and unlike Sensui, he's genuinely done nothing wrong. Unfortunately, this plot thread ends up going absolutely nowhere. So we'll go ahead and just drop that in the missed opportunity bucket. This bucket will 100% be full by the time we're done, so uh, leave a comment below and see if you can guess how many missed opportunities I'm going to bring up in this. When we get back to Yusuke and Kuroko, she comments on the time she met Sensui when he took over the duties as spirit detective. According to her, she could feel how strong he was, but remarks that he also seemed fragile, which does track with what we came to know about Sensui over the course of Chapter Black's arc. Their conversation is cut short by the arrival of three demons, Hokushin, Toho, and Seite, who have come to retrieve Yusuke and take him back to Demon World with them. Yusuke doubts the validity of their claims, jabbing that they have the spiritual presence of a piece of bubblegum, which is actually remarkably amusing considering what Hokushin's power is. Hokushin fires back that Seite and Toho are A-class demons, whereas he is considered an S-class. This is the beginning of a huge power creep issue that the series has. When we first learn about the demon classification system, S-class demons are considered exceedingly rare but devastatingly powerful. And here we are, two episodes into the arc, and we're immediately introduced to the first of soon-to-be numerous S-class demons. The logic of the story does end up collapsing under the weight of its own power creep later on, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Anyway, Yusuke brings up a good point that A and S class demons like them shouldn't have even been able to pass into human world, but Hokushin shows the detectives that with the use of an organic device affixed to their chests, they can forcibly lower their demon energy to a weak enough state that they can pass between realms unrestricted. This actually opens up a plot hole in my mind, specifically with Hokushin stating that there were other means of traversing worlds, but the rules forbid it. That's all fine and dandy, but then he goes on to say that there are no laws regarding the use of the organic device they currently have in their possession. And if that's the case, you'd think that more upper rank demons would know about it and would have slipped through to human world. Hokushin mentions that they need to wear the devices the entire time they're in human world, but he doesn't exactly clarify why that is. If we're not given a digestible reason as to why they can't remove the device, we're left to wonder why they simply don't. At best, it's an incomplete explanation, and at worst, it's a glaring plot hole. Getting down to brass tacks, Hokushin tells Yusuke that his ancestor sent them there to request an audience with Yusuke and escort him back to Demon World. The demon informs Yusuke, and by proxy the audience, that there's an ongoing conflict that has left Demon World divided into three kingdoms. My issue with this is the information we were given at the beginning of Chapter Black. Koenma told us that Demon World is like an endless basement with floor after floor of which Spirit World only controls half the first floor. I know that was just a metaphor to help Team Urameshi wrap their heads around Demon World's size, but that doesn't change the reality of the absurdity, because now we're being told that three demons are running everything in Demon World. It's tough to square this circle, especially with additional details that surface later on, but all we can do is roll with it for now. The conflict between the three kingdoms stems from the issue of food. Demons find the most satisfaction for their hunger in human flesh. But one day, one of the kings, Ryzen, took an opposing stance and decided to stop feeding on humans. The second of the kings, Makuro, admitted that they can't stand to eat anything other than humans, but even then, they'd already begun taking steps to curb their appetite. The third of the kings, Yomi, did not mince words, saying that they should eat as many humans as they want considering our explosive population growth. Because all three of the kings were comparable in power and in constant disagreement with one another, they've been locked in a stalemate for 500 years. This number seems to fluctuate every time it's brought up over the course of the arc, so I'm just going to relay the numbers that the show gives me, so don't be breathing down my neck over this. This is when we learn that Hokushin and Pals are there to retrieve Yusuke because Ryzen is on death's door due to malnutrition thanks to his multi-century hunger strike. If Ryzen dies and there's no one to fill that void, the remaining kings will have the green light to finally go to war with each other and forcefully determine the fate of Demon World, and simultaneously determine Demon World's relationship with the other two realms. But, if Yusuke is there and trained to lead, there's a fighting chance that balance between the kingdoms could be preserved. After the rundown, Yusuke believes Hokushin's tale, but still feels something is out of place, though he can't quite identify what's bothering him. The two step outside for a scrap after Hokushin calls Yusuke out by saying they both know the detective is weaker than him. Yusuke gets got pretty easily, which is kind of annoying to see considering how good of a warrior we all know he is. Yusuke is not terribly book smart, but he knows how to throw down. 
A big part of Chapter Black was instilling in him the idea that he can't just rush into a battle without considering or knowing his enemy's abilities. But all of that development and leveling up go right out the window and Hokushin secures a stupidly easy victory. I genuinely can't tell you how much this annoys me. I understand there needed to be a demonstration of power in some form, but wouldn't it have made more sense for Yusuke to win, thus verifying that he's a solid candidate for replacing Ryzen? Yusuke lost to the demon equivalent of a pack of bubble tape. If I was Toho or Seite, I'd be taking a page out of Eric Killmonger's book. Is this shit gay? Anyway, after that one-sided tussle ends, Yusuke manages to get a good punch in when he realizes what it was that was bothering him in regard to their story. The stench of rotting flesh coming from Hokushin's mouth while he was in close proximity to Yusuke put the last piece into place. Hokushin and pals continue to eat humans, despite the wishes and state of their king. We find out that Yusuke punched Hokushin not because of this discovery, but because Hokushin wasn't being transparent. Yusuke takes an empathetic approach to this revelation. Give me some credit, Baldi. I get it. Food is food, and to you, people is food. Hokushin gives Yusuke a week to get his affairs in order before he leaves for Demon World, and the group vanishes. Kuroko, who is eavesdropping nearby like an asshole, tells Yusuke he would be better off in Demon World. She scolds him for the comment in which he describes people as food and accepted that Hokushin and pals continue to consume humans. Even though this annoys me because bitch, who even are you? I do like the fact that it kind of nods back to the themes of Chapter Black in terms of placing the value of a human life above that of a demon. While Yusuke understands that demons didn't choose to be born that way, Kuroko clearly sees it as a black and white issue. Kuroko also mentions that earlier in the week, a reaper appeared before her requesting that she kill Yusuke. But considering she's a retired spirit detective that doesn't answer to spirit world anymore, she refused. However, Kuroko follows that up by saying that she was convinced Yusuke was someone worth protecting at first, especially because they were so similar. But now she says she can't trust him. Her flip of opinion is lightning fast and stems from that one exchange between Yusuke and Hokushin, so it doesn't feel organic. Sure, this is mostly to compel Yusuke into actually going to Demon World, but he was already motivated to go in order to settle the score over Ryzen's intervention with his fight with Sensui, so that aspect doesn't feel necessary. The threads for an interesting dynamic between Yusuke and Kuroko were definitely there, particularly with a compelling conflict born of the fact that they're both technically good people. It does run the risk of rehashing some themes of Chapter Black, but considering she'd only be one layer of the narrative and not the main narrative, it could have worked for Yusuke's portion of the story. It was kind of a waste for her to just vanish from the story altogether, so into the bucket you go, Kuroko. At the conclusion of this scene, Kuroko's husband tells Yusuke his fortune, saying that he sees a great separation forming between he and his friends, specifically a separation drawn in blood. This foreshadowing sounds really cool on paper, but I'm advising you to temper your expectations right now. Once we're done there, we cut to Kurama, who is approached by three strangers and given a spirit of words, which is basically the equivalent of like a magic TikTok. Uh, he gets it from Yomi, one of the three kings. It's clear from Kurama's reaction that there's a familiarity there, though to what extent will become clearer in a bit. In his message, Yomi summons Kurama back to Demon World to assist him in dethroning Ryzen and Makuro on his path to unifying all of Demon World under one banner. He mentions having known Kurama for a long time, and while the diction is cordial, there's a tension to the scene that's further emphasized by just how unhappy Kurama appears to be, especially when Yomi mentions that he's apprehended the one who stole his light. Hiei is there too, eavesdropping on Kurama's message before revealing that he had also received a TikTok from the last of the kings, Makuro. The two of them watch the message from Makuro together, who attempts to recruit Hiei by revealing that Ryzen is on the brink of death, and when he dies, Makuro intends to launch a full-scale assault against Yomi to prevent him from unifying Demon World under a singular, peaceful banner. So, quick side note, because it's something that I've either forgotten, overlooked, or maybe it's just missing. But why does Makuro specifically bother to recruit Hiei? For the life of me, I can't think of a reason why, or how Makuro would even know or care who he is. I'm jumping ahead a bit here, but when Hiei faces Shigure, Makuro is surprised that they know each other, so that couldn't have been the connection. So how long have you been working for old bandage face? Since shortly after you left my services, Hiei. You two know each other? And it isn't until much later that Makuro finds out what Hiei is searching for, so that isn't even leverage yet. It's bizarre to me because Yusuke and Kurama both have very distinct reasons for their respective kings to request their presence, whereas Hiei just ends up being summoned because that's what the story required. But again, maybe I've missed or forgotten the throwaway line of dialogue. Anyway, we get a few scenes between Yusuke and Keiko as he drops the bomb on her that he's leaving for Demon World to figure out who and what he really is. It's clear that she's devastated by the news, and it actually hits pretty hard considering all she's seen Yusuke go through and stuck by him anyway. 
of this conversation, the thing that always gets me is when the two are by the river together making small talk. Keiko stands up and tells Yusuke to give her a call when he gets back so she can introduce him to her new boyfriend. Because as far as she knows, he could be gone for a year, two years, five years, or forever. But the line that really sells her sadness is when she peeks over her shoulder and simply says, Nice knowing you. They don't make eye contact for a while, and their expressions aren't shown to emphasize how crushed they both must feel. Keiko for having to watch him go, and Yusuke for having to say goodbye. Yusuke makes her laugh one more time before she lets out a choked up farewell and scurries off. She runs for a few moments, then slows to a walk before taking off again. It's that feeling of wanting so desperately to stay when the reality of the situation really settles in, but running ahead anyway. It's a relatable feeling for anyone that's gone through a breakup that wasn't necessarily messy, but still hurt like hell. In a way, I feel like messy breakups are easier than those situations where your hearts are lined up, but life just pulls you in opposite directions. Yusuke stops by Kuwabara's house, but ends up standing outside. He can tell is studying, having been told by Keiko that he's working to get into a good high school, so he just moves along. It's Yusuke caring about Kuwabara in his own way, not wanting to interrupt Kuwabara's pursuit of a brighter future, especially because there's a strong chance he won't be there. So I pull Kuwabara's focus away from something that really matters just to stress him out. Yusuke makes one last stop at Keiko's family restaurant, which doubles as their home. As he's eating, he promises her that he'll make it back to Human World by his 18th birthday, and upon his return, he promises to marry her. There's a really nice moment that the two share at the end of this episode, but I'll just leave that for you to watch for yourself. Eventually, Kuwabara is summoned to Genkai's compound by Botan, where he's told that Yusuke is going back to Demon World. Needless to say, he's not exactly happy about that. Yusuke explains that he's going in order to really see what's next for him and what he's truly capable of, pointing out that it's too dangerous to have him around in the event he loses control of his own body again. This is also what we're told by Koenma that Yusuke has officially been stripped of his title as spirit detective and given a dishonorable discharge alongside the green light on Yusuke's head. Genkai tries to temper Kuwabara's disappointment by saying she's tried her best to guide Yusuke toward the light, despite the fact that the more he learns about himself, the more questions arise. She goes on to say that they owe it to Yusuke to allow him to fumble around in the dark for himself, looking for answers. Soon after their meeting, the Spirit Defense Force shows up, ready to open a portal to Demon World for Yusuke. According to them, King Yama agreed to grant Yusuke safe passage out of Human World because doing so will kill two birds with one stone. It would effectively quarantine Yusuke as well as preserve peace in spirit and human world, free from the threat of a Mazuku roaming free. Hiei and Kurama show up, revealing that they too have received requests to return to Demon World, requests that they both intend to accept, much to Kuwabara's dismay. Yusuke takes a moment to encourage Kuwabara to work hard to get into the school he wants to, also making him a similar promise to the one that he made Keiko, that he'd be back in a few years. They say their farewells, and Yusuke takes off to Demon World, where he's immediately met by Hokushin and Bald Boy 1. After Yusuke's departure, the audience is informed by Koenma that the Spirit Defense Force also plans to escort Kurama and Hiei to Demon World. But what's intriguing is that while the Three Kings invited each of our boys themselves, they also sent word to King Yama, seeking extradition of them. The reasoning being that it was much safer to have these powerful and potentially dangerous demons quarantined in their realm, to which the king agreed. Hokushin and his fellow hair enthusiasts escort Yusuke to Ryzen's kingdom. And by escort, I mean they sprint for four days straight from the place of Yusuke's arrival, which begs the question, how did they even arrive at the place of his arrival at that exact time? They arrive at Ryzen's kingdom, which looks like a toddler built a bunch of mud huts. That is one big pile of shit. Hokushin expresses his amazement at Yusuke's ability to keep up with them at their maximum speed, even admitting that they'd purposely tried to leave him behind. A loud rumbling causes Yusuke to wonder if it's the thunder of a coming storm, but Charlie Brown informs him that it's the sound of Ryzen's empty stomach and that they use the predictable rumbling to mark the passage of time. My tummies. Take a moment to think that one out logically. Imagine how loud that shit must be the closer you get to the source. And then, Yusuke finally comes face to face with Ryzen. You're too big and cool to give your old man a hug. You're not my dad! Yusuke and Ryzen get into it after the dying demon calls the former detective out for being weak, saying that if he hadn't intervened in Yusuke's fight with Sensui, Sensui would have killed him. It's a small line, but I think it's pretty cool to think that Chapter Black could have had an entirely different outcome had Ryzen not stepped in. Yusuke was still brand new to being a half-demon, so it stands to reason he didn't have the proper insight to tap into the amount of power he'd have needed to properly defeat Sensui. With the centuries of experience Ryzen has, I'm sure it wasn't terribly difficult to see the trajectory of the fight when paired with Yusuke's cockiness and inability to truly wield the power afforded by his heritage. Was it a dick move to intervene in the way he did? Sure, but it was also the act of a being looking to protect his bloodline. 
It's one of those things that is just kind of casually tossed out there, but they don't linger on it aside from being like, oh no, stop being weak. As to be expected, their scuffle is a one-sided beatdown from Ryzen. Eventually, the Demon King makes Yusuke a deal. If he can move him from his throne, he will gladly give Yusuke both it and his life. Yusuke fires off a massive spirit gun, blowing a hole in the side of the throne room. Ryzen tanks it like a chad, and I'm sure he'd be T-posing to assert dominance if he wasn't suffering from malnutrition. Despite taking the blast, he's no longer sitting on the throne since, you know, it was obliterated by Yusuke. Ryzen mocks Yusuke for the ridiculous technicality but still honors his words to him. He tells Yusuke that he'll get the throne soon enough but says he'll need to get much stronger if he has any hope of fending off those who would seek to do him harm. This is when we also get a one year limit to the time Yusuke has to become stronger and Ryzen himself saying at the rate his body is shrinking he'll likely be dead within the year. Unfortunately for the audience, this one year limitation has no real bearing on the way the story unfolds. It's more of an arbitrary detail than a definitive part of the narrative tension since as you'll see, most of it happens off screen. Elsewhere, Hiei is having a recurring dream of a group of women just like Yukina who talk about one of their own having a set of twins, with one being a boy. From their tone, it's evident that a male being born into their tribe isn't exactly a good thing. The elder of the group instructs the woman to throw the baby off a cliff, going so far as to refer to the child as a beast, further instructing the woman holding him not to show it any pity. Naturally, it's easy to infer that these are Hiei's memories. We get our first scene with Makuro and his right-hand man, Kirin. We learn that six months have passed since the members of Team Yurameshi arrived in Demon World. See what I mean about that one-year window not really meaning much? The scene with Ryzen telling Yusuke that was literally the end of the previous episode. Anyway, their conversation enlightens us that Makuro is putting Hiei through hellish training by consistently subjecting him to battling hordes of A-class demons. From how tired Hiei is, it's likely that he's not being given adequate time to rest in between assaults from groups as large as 500. Not to mention, as we've seen in the Dark Tournament as well as Chapter Black, when he expends a great deal of energy, he goes into a hibernation-type state. So this nightmarish training is most likely Makuro's way of raising Hiei's stamina cap. When he passes out again, we get more insight into the place of his birth, the home of the ice apparitions which live isolated on an island floating in the sky that's devoid of men. According to Hiei's stream, every 100 years, to each woman, a child is born through immaculate means. These Jesus babies are always girls, unless the mother in question violated the laws of their people and conceived the child with a man. Turns out Hiei was stunningly conscious of the things going on around him, even as a newborn. A friend of Hiei's mother was the one tasked with tossing him off the side of the floating island. The only thing that saved Hiei from the fall was the resolve to return one day and kill every ice apparition on that island. So yeah, he kinda held a grudge. After Hiei awakens, Makuro shows up like, damn, you sure have killed a bunch of my people. Hiei mocks Makuro's mummy-like appearance and says that he still has no idea why he was summoned or even what Makuro looks like. So Mummies Alive proposes a challenge, noting that Hiei still had growth potential. Makuro will bring one last opponent, a stronger one, and if Hiei could beat them, Makuro would reveal what's under the bandages. Aside from the hundreds and hundreds of A-class demons that Makuro keeps in his ranks, many of which Hiei has already killed, Makuro maintains a group of 77 elite warriors for his personal guard. On top of offering to show himself, Makuro also relays that if Hiei beats one of the warriors from his personal guard, Hiei will then be offered that warrior's place in said guard. This is the point in which Makuro also hints that he knows what it is Hiei is searching for in Demon World. Hiei is visibly wearing his Hiroseki stone during this section of the story, so my guess is that Tagashi kind of rode himself into a narrative corner and realized that Hiei had no real connection to the arc yet in the same way that Yusuke and Kurama did. It feels like damage control for a small plot hole considering how important Hiei needs to become to Makuro. I get the feeling that Hiei calling out this lack of a reason for being there was part of the attempt to wallpaper over that criticism, but drawing attention to it doesn't necessarily save it. It's kind of like when a movie ends up being bad and a supporter of that film defends it by saying, well it was meant to be campy. The intent doesn't necessarily make up for the product if the product isn't well executed. Moving on, we see through a flashback that the stone Hiei is wearing was given to him by Yukina who asked Hiei to locate her brother, give him the stone, and tell him that he has a sister looking for him in Human World. When an ice apparition gives birth, she sheds one tear that appears different from the standard Hiroseki stone, but their mother shed two tears, one for each child. Yukina was told that her brother's was tucked inside the sealed bandages he was wrapped in before he was yeeted out of Winterfell. Being her brother, Hiei went on to wear the stone she gave him, which draws attention to the absence of the stone that rightfully belongs to him. Naturally, locating his own stone was just as big a part of his quest as finding the home of the ice apparitions. Soon Makuro returns with Hiei's opponent, a man Hiei has history with named Shigure, Surgeon of the Damned. 
Shigure is the man that taught Hiei how to properly wield a sword, making him the swordsman he is today. We're also given the knowledge that Hiei wasn't born with a Jigan eye, but instead, Shigure performed a transplant procedure to give Hiei the Jigan. Doing so had reduced Hiei's demon energy to nearly nothing at the time. Hiei requested the Jiganai as a means of helping him locate his lost stone, as well as the home of the Ice Apparitions. This is when we learn why Hiei has never told Yukina who he is, despite going out of his way to look for her. The price Shigure required in exchange for the surgery was that even if he found his sister, Hiei could not tell her who he was. A pretty cruel and ironic price, but one Hiei has clearly agreed to. There doesn't seem to be a penalty for Hiei failing to uphold his end of the bargain though, aside from his sense of honor. Makuro knows that in his current state, Hiei is outclassed by Shigure. However, Makuro seems aware of the height of power Hiei reached when devastated by the loss of Yusuke in the previous arc, followed by the further spike in power upon Yusuke's return. Makuro knows that if Hiei can tap into that reservoir and fully command it, he can overcome Shigure and ascend to even greater heights. Again, this may or may not retroactively explain why Hiei was recruited in the first place, and if this was supposed to be the reason in general, it's just bad storytelling. Hiei and Shigure begin their pretty rad, albeit short, death match. Hiei knows that he needs to strike quickly and definitively, because if he doesn't, his chances of survival fall dramatically. The Fisher-Price-sized swordsman ponders on the state of his life, how he's fallen back into a cycle of mindless violence without anything to fight for, and remarks that there's no dignity left in that kind of existence. These thoughts are what grant him the resolve to face the dreadfully high likelihood of death. As Hiei hurdles towards Shigure, we're treated to a series of flashbacks detailing more of Hiei's past. After surviving the fall from his homeland and being spared the series finale of Game of Thrones, Hiei was discovered floating downriver by a group of bandits that took him in and raised him. Hiei admits that even as a kid, he found tremendous pleasure in spilling the blood of his enemies. B basically, he spent his childhood cosplaying as Guts from Berserk. Once he realized how valuable his birthstone was, he'd wear it in clear view of others as a form of bait, hoping to pick fights with those greedy enough to attempt to take it from him. He eventually got so caught up in looking for fights that he began to wonder if locating his homeland even truly mattered to him. Eventually, Hiei's incessant search for violence resulted in him being shunned by the bandits who raised him, likely out of fear of his seemingly endless bloodlust. It isn't long before Hiei's baiting causes him to lose his stone, prompting him to once again vow to do whatever he needed to locate both it and his homeland. And this is what leads him to Shigure, who originally refused to operate on him. After some convincing, the surgeon relents but says he'll only perform the procedure if Hiei's lived an interesting life, requiring Hiei to tell him his life story. Before the operation begins, Shigure hits Hiei with the phrase that DMs use to let their D&D players know that they're heading into the danger zone. Are you sure you want to go through with this? Hiei admits that never before or since has he experienced the intense level of agony he was subjected to during that procedure. Danger zone! <laughs> Considering that Shigure was the one that taught Hiei his fighting technique, our three-eyed boy notes that it seemed fitting for him to die by the surgeon's hands, resigned to the high probability of their clash ending in his demise. Hiei sacrifices his left arm to divert Shigure's blade, which allows him to take Shigure's left arm as well. Recovering from the attack, Shigure lands a fatal blow to Hiei's abdomen and also breaks Hiei's sword. However, in the moment it takes for the men to pass by one another after the exchange, Hiei manages to get one last swing in that cleaves through Shigure's skull. As Hiei sits there on the floor bleeding out, Makuro reveals that he is in possession of the Hiroseki stone Hiei had spent so much time searching for. Apparently, it was given to Makuro as a gift from a land he'd conquered. Because of course. Plot convenience. You see what I mean about Hiei's connection to this arc feeling flimsy? It's kind of disappointing considering how good his personal arc ends up being overall, and if they found a way to make his connection to Makuro feel less forced, it would have been easier to buy into. It doesn't destroy my enjoyment of Hiei's story by any means, it just irks me as someone who prefers to have all the pieces line up fluidly. Anyway, Makuro returns the stone to Hiei before the wounded man passes out, during which time Makuro becomes curious about the rest of Hiei's story and links their minds together because that's just a thing Makuro can do, I guess. After Hiei recovered from his surgery with the assistance of the Jigan, he found the home of the ice apparitions within days. Despite his journey, Hiei came to pity the women of his homeland due to their gloomy, timid dispositions. He comments that it felt like their spirits had been frozen and they were incapable of love. His desire to kill them and burn the place to the ground dissipated because to him, in their own way, they were already dead. Hiei confronts the woman that attempted to cast Fetus Deletus on him, looking for his mother, but is ultimately taken to a grave instead. Hiei's mother unalived herself a few years after his exile due to the immense grief of what her people had done. His search to find Yukina after this is what brought him into contact with Kurama for the first time, which we'll actually get to see later on when I cover the OVAs on this channel, so make sure that you're subscribed and hit the bell icon so that you don't miss out on that video. 
We realize that Hiei was so willing to resign himself to death because Yukina's gift to him had fulfilled his life's purpose, and according to him, anything that lay ahead of him after that would be and feel empty. To Hiei, there was nothing left for him to do except end his journey. Having other plans, Makuro places Hiei in a recovery pod and removes the mummy-like bandages in front of the unconscious man, though the Jigan Eye is still watching. But what's this? Holy crap, I'm a girl! Yep, Makuro's a woman. But given the voice acting in the English dub, it wasn't exactly tough to deduce. Makuro reveals that she was born into slavery, and among the many things she was robbed of during that time, her spirit was among them. She comments that the stone she'd been in possession of was what prevented her from completely succumbing to the darkness that had taken root inside of her, empathizing with Hiei's desire to retrieve it by any means. Uh, and then she gets naked, to which we're shown the right half of her body has been turned into beef jerky, and that she has some prosthetic limbs. It's evident by the end of the segment that Hiei and Makuro are bonded by a shared sense of pain and loneliness that their past have burned into their hearts. This becomes the crux of their story arc. Or, at the very least, what's left of their story arc? This whole chunk was literally 90% of their story arc. They get one more episode after this to hammer out the remainder of their story arc, and it's near the end of the series. Now we pivot to the final pair of this arc, Karama and Yomi. Karama, with the use of some personal techno-wizardry, receives a phone call from his mother on his cell phone while still in Demon World, maintaining the illusion that he's still watching over their home while his mother is away on a trip. Over the course of this arc, we get to see Karama in the role of Suichi more than usual, placing heavy emphasis on just how important his human life has become for him since his arrival in Living World. Karama mentions that his mother got remarried in July, and we see that while Kuwabara was at the wedding, Yusuke was not since he'd left two months prior. However, we do get to see a small exchange between the fox and former detective where Yusuke laments that he's going to miss the ceremony and passes along his well wishes. Karama comments that he's glad Yusuke cared about the wedding, and further remarks that he hasn't forgotten the risk Yusuke took to ensure that both Karama and his mother got to continue living. This reminds the audience exactly what it was that began their friendship, and it feels like ancient history considering the staggering number of obstacles they've overcome since the early days. For the sake of his own convenience, given his summons to Demon World by Yomi, Karama sent his mother and stepfather on an all-expenses-paid trip overseas for the full month of August. Unlike Yusuke and Hiei, Karama agreed to return to Demon World only on the condition that the trip not last longer than the month of August. During his trip, he'll be serving as an advisor to Yomi's army. Yomi's kingdom looks like an actual modern-day city, complete with electronics, skyscrapers, a street grid, and so on. It's easily the most sophisticated of the three when compared to Ryzen's shipbrick citadel and Makuro's giant cockroach. Upon reaching the city limits, Karama is ambushed by three demons of whom he easily disposes. Yomi's first true interaction with Karama is a joke based on his blindness, to which Karama seems oddly offended by. It's been far too long since I've seen you. I don't appreciate the pun. At first glance, it seems out of place for Karama to be so annoyed by such a simple greeting, but given their story arc on repeated viewings, it marks the second time Yomi has referenced his lack of vision, as well as Karama's tense response to both mentions of it. Perceptive viewers will pick up on the hint that Karama has something to do with Yomi's disability, and that likely plays a big role in his reluctance to be in Yomi's presence. When questioned why Yomi had Karama attacked, the king comments that he needed to be sure it was real Karama in the first place since his energy feels so different. Karama replies that doing so shows a high level of caution, which is a trait Yomi apparently did not possess back when he knew him. Yomi tells Karama that Ryzen and Makuro have both had centuries to perfect their ability to maintain power and would basically jump at the chance to dethrone him in their current power struggle. Karama states that a thousand years is a long time, referencing the conflict of the kings, but Yomi replies with, For some things it's not clearly referring to something else. Even though this is their first on-screen conversation, it is absolutely littered with hints about their past together as well as their personal feelings toward one another. It's honestly kind of brilliant in terms of establishing their relationship if you ask me. Following this tense reunion, Karama is invited to attend a council meeting regarding the state of the conflict where Yomi's advisor Yuda projects the death of Ryzen leaving Makuro and Yomi in a dead heat as a power vacuum sets in. Yuda suggests recruiting defectors from Ryzen's camp to tip the scales in their favor. Yomi admits that the tactic is sound, but then asks Karama what his opinion is. Karama dunks on Yuda's PowerPoint presentation by explaining that the deciding factor of the conflicts as it stands won't be the kings themselves, but their second strongest man. However, until the second strongest is on par with the king of the respective territory, they ultimately won't matter either. This annoys Sachi, who is the commander of Yomi's military and also happens to be the second strongest in the territory. 
Kurama gets under his skin even further by saying that in 6 months, each territory's second strongest will be usurped. This leads the audience to assume that Yusuke, Hiei, and Kurama will inevitably rise up to outclass the current right hand in each territory. Yusuke will outclass Hokushin, Hiei will outclass Kirin, and Kurama himself will take Sachi's place at Yomi's side. After the conference concludes, Yomi tells the spirit fox that Sachi is literally already plotting to kill him, citing the heat he could feel from the blood vessels in Sachi's eyes leering in Kurama's direction. Kurama comments that he seems to be able to see a lot for a blind man, and Yomi tells him that losing his sight was part of what made him stronger. He's basically Daredevil now, except, you know, he's a demon. A dare demon, if you will. Yomi then takes Kurama to meet the one who took Yomi's light, and we again see a clear reluctance from Kurama. The power dynamic is on full display as Yomi notes the quickened pace of Kurama's heartbeat and demands that he raise his averted gaze. When the door to the prison cell opens, there's the decaying demon, nailed to the wall, being kept alive by unknown means. Yomi informs us that the prisoner hardly talks anymore, the pain caused by his decay too great. That's when we get a flashback to a thousand years ago, when Kurama and Yomi used to run together as part of the same crew. Except back then, the roles were reversed. Kurama was the leader and Yomi was the right hand man. The pair wanted to become lords, but to do so required wealth, which led them to becoming bandits. Yomi was hot headed and favored direct confrontation, where Kurama favored stealth. It wasn't long before Yomi disobeyed Kurama altogether, leading their best men into raids on Demon World's most well-fortified strongholds and getting many of them killed. When in reality, the only raid he needed was Raid Shadow Legends! Kid, I'm kidding. I, I am kidding. Despite being a loose cannon, Kurama kept Yomi on board, even warning him that his awful character would be the death of him. Shortly after, Yomi heard rumors of another fortress guarding unspeakable treasures and he once again disobeyed Kurama to go check it out. When he and his group arrived, the place seemed to be deserted, but they're suddenly attacked by a stranger. This stranger is obviously the one we saw being held captive in such a wretched state by Yomi in the present day. The demon blinds Yomi before saying life is more important than the reward, and scampering off. And unlike his screw-ups in the past, Kurama didn't show up to rescue him this time. Following this event, Yomi realized that he hadn't seen or heard from Kurama since before his run-in with the assailant, nor did he have any idea where Kurama even was. With these thoughts in mind, Yomi came to wonder why that was the case. He figured the best way to get that answer was to track down the demon that blinded him, so he spent centuries doing exactly that. Yomi picks up on the fact that Kurama's heart rate had gone back to normal after seeing the awful condition the captive was in, remarking that it was as if Kurama had realized this demon was no longer a threat to him. This extreme level of physical perception afforded to Yomi is part of what makes him so interesting and so incredibly dangerous. He can tell where someone's eyes are pointed, how intense they're looking based on the heat given off by their eyes, their heart rate, and so on. Homeboy's got six ears, so some might say that it's like he can hear 16 times the detail. The captive demon begs for his life to be ended, and Yomi is prepared to grant this plea on the condition that he reveal who it was that ordered him to ambush Yomi's crew back in the day. The demon admits that the order came from Yoko, much to Kurama's dismay. In a momentary fit of rage, Yomi crushes the demon's head against the wall with his foot. It's not really important, it's just kind of brutal and cool. Yomi had long suspected Kurama was the one behind the incident, but wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. But with the truth out in the open now, Yomi empathizes with the choice Kurama made all those years ago. He says he understands why Kurama did what he did, and that he likely would have done the same thing if the roles were reversed. Naturally, Kurama presses him on what it is he truly wants, and Yomi reiterates that he wants Kurama's help, exactly like the spirit of words said. However, when Kurama puts forward the hypothetical of refusing, Yomi demonstrates that he's aware Kurama's mother is on a plane at that very moment, making his threat quite clear. Yomi also demonstrates nearly complete knowledge of Kurama's life after entering Human World, so it's evident that through his vast network, he kept tabs on the spirit fox. The Blind King then calls Kurama out on the discrepancy between what he says and what he does, which draws further attention to the difference that genuinely exists between Suichi Minamino and Yoko Kurama. It asks the audience to truly wonder where one personality stops and the other one begins. Either way, Yomi's power play has completely trapped Kurama under his thumb. As time goes on, we see that Sachi and a heroin addicted version of Gumby have taken to spying on Kurama and Yomi, but can't discern anything due to the fact that the two men tend to speak between the lines to hide their intent. Sachi is very obviously agitated by the fact that not only is Kurama a newcomer and an outsider, but the reality that Yomi treats his words like a crypto wallet full of Bitcoin and Sachi's like a desktop folder full of NFTs. Over with the two main men, Kurama informs Yomi of six demons he'd met previously, referring to the Dark Tournament, and asks Yomi for time to recruit and train them on his behalf. Yomi mocks Kurama, saying that he only pretends to care about others, and that the six he's referring to are just tools to further his own goals. No pun intended, but Yomi can't see all of the growth Kurama has undergone despite having kept tabs on him, yet it's still interesting to see just how different of a person Yomi knew versus the character we've come to know. 
Karama offers to bring the fighters to Yomi in exchange for some time to return home to tend to family affairs. He makes it known that he's aware Yomi will be watching him anyway. We pivot to Karama's school, where Kaito comes over to look at his test. Noticing all the mistakes Karama made, which is uncharacteristic of the otherwise flawless scholar, Kaito picks up on the quiet distress of the fox. Karama doesn't give him all the details, but does mention that he, Yusuke, and Hiei are all on opposing sides. Kaito offers his help in the event Karama needs it, but Karama doesn't accept, understanding that the conflict is a demon world affair that humans shouldn't get involved in. This thought process kind of sends Karama into an existential spiral regarding the personas that lie within him. He reflects on the fact that he's been living two lives under two identities, Suichi, the normal teenager, and Karama, the warrior who aids in the fight to protect human world. Yet, as of late, a third and much darker personality, the one we've come to identify as Yoko, has been re-emerging. A persona that, according to him, survives on bloodlust and brutal instinct. Karama is painfully aware of the weight trying to live all three lives would impose on him, and he says, I cannot juggle them all, but which one will I lose? This gives the audience a further understanding of the arc Karama is going to go through during this conflict, and it's kind of an interesting parallel to Yusuke's own arc. For Yusuke, he's trying to figure out exactly who and what he is so that he can decide what that means for his future. Karama already has a deep understanding of who he's been and who he's become, but he's coming to the realization that he needs to choose for the sake of his own future exactly who it is he wants to be. We're briefly introduced to Karama's stepbrother, Kokoda, after he pages him during the school day. Karama relays that Kokoda should also be in school, noting the oddity of the page before going out to meet with his sibling. Karama sees through the charade right away and Methhead Gumby appears, showing that he's possessed Kokoda and is using him to relay information and spy on the spirit fox. Karama assumes Yomi sent the parasitic demon, but is told that Sachi is actually the guilty party. It's Sachi's goal to make sure Karama doesn't return to Demon World, but after rolling pretty high on an intimidation check, Karama sways the demon into his service. Transitioning to Genkai's compound, the old bat conveys to Karama that the training for the fighters he chose is going well, but she doesn't think it's enough, even going so far as to doubt that Yusuke's strength would be enough to help settle the coming dispute. Mid-conversation, Koenma shows up in his official robes again, commenting that the Demon World situation was more important to King Yama than their family feud. Koenma understands that to some degree, Yusuke, Hiei, and Karama are all fighting for some inner need, but sternly reminds him that the stakes this time around are too high for that. After Ryzen's death, the ensuing power vacuum will send everything into complete pandemonium, with the following moments being crucial in determining the fate of Demon World, as well as its relationship to the neighboring realms. Koenma explains that if Makuro ends up in control, it'll bring a new level of chaos to the world, but Karama retorts by saying if Yomi should emerge victorious, it could bring unity to Demon World, which is arguably just as dangerous. No matter what the outcome is, it'll affect demon, spirit, and human world for centuries to come. When they're done, we finally get to see who it was that Karama went out of his way to recruit. Chu, Jin, Toya, Rinku, Suzuka, and Shishi Wakamaru. While I think Rinku, Suzuka, and Shishi were odd choices given the gravity of the situation, also considering that Bui exists and he survived the Dark Tournament, it is nice to have them back on screen after an entire arc without them. Specifically, Chu and Jin. Training the group in private was part of Karama's plan to unify their cause to fight to preserve the balance of all three worlds. He needed to do so in a place beyond Yomi's senses and network if he had any real chance of undermining Yomi over time from the inside. After a demonstration of their growing power, Genkai tells them that they'll be going into a war zone so they'll need to get even stronger if they plan to live. I really like the implications of this as well as the seriousness of the stakes as expressed by Koenma. It really highlights the idea that shit is about to hit the fan and once it does, all hell is going to break loose. And there's a tangible fear from Koenma that this tidal wave of chaos could spill into human world and spirit world too. Small details like this are what I enjoy about this arc, but unfortunately for us, all of these amazingly tantalizing plot threads and ideas are going to be thrown right into the bucket of missed opportunities very soon. So let me just go ahead and do that now. Once we return to Yomi's city, we see Sachi attempt to persuade the king to forget about Karama. But Yomi's like, nah, I like my new old boyfriend much better than some freaky fish guy. I am not a freaky fish guy! Karama presents his crew to Yomi, who all have their demon energy measured at or around 120,000. I think it's bizarre that they chose now to use a numerical system for power level since we don't have a baseline understanding for what an average demons would be. It would be easier to convey their point by labeling them with the ranking system established at the beginning of Chapter Black. It is much too late in the series for a set of large numbers to mean anything to us. However, based on how Yuta reacts, we can infer that these are indeed high power levels. Not that that'll matter soon anyway. After keeping his word, Yomi decides to officially make Karama the second in command, and Kanye West's fish stick doesn't take it very well. He plans to murder Karama, but measures his power level first, and it clocks in just under 9,000. 
Sachi confronts Kurama and goes for the kill, but Yoko comes out to play and promptly shuts that shit down. Before he dies, the power reader shows Sachi that Yoko has a power level of 152,000. Yomi, listening in on the conflict, celebrates Yoko's return, saying it's about time he took over from Kurama. It once again draws a close eye to Kurama's ongoing war of identities, and suggests to the audience that Yoko might end up being the dominant identity. Now, to clarify, when I refer to Kurama's war of personalities, I don't mean it in the same way as Sensui. In Kurama's case, they're kind of like masks, aspects of himself that he allows to the surface depending on the situation. Despite these being different masks, per se, at the core it's always the same person in control. Think of it like who you are depending on who's around or what the situation calls for. You have different masks based on if you're at work, if you're with friends, if you're dealing with something tough or stressful, or if you're just by yourself. It's the same with our favorite fox, with Yoko being more firmly attached to his base instincts, Suichi being the boy he carries himself as in the human world to blend in but also to just live life, and Kurama being a compromise between both. At all times, Kurama is in control, but he's doing a complex dance while walking a tightrope and trying to juggle every detail of his lives so that they don't overlap at the wrong times. And he's painfully aware that he can only juggle everything for so long before something comes crashing down. So we're finally coming to the final stretch of what I would consider to be the good portion of this arc. Just like what I've been saying so far, it's not perfect by any means, but it's certainly more enjoyable than where we ultimately end up. The longer the arc goes on, even though we're still early in its lifespan, the more you can feel Tagashi's burnout. It's tough to be angry about the quality of this arc when considering just how much Tagashi was struggling with his health back then. Hell, he's still struggling with the same health issues to this day, and I wouldn't be surprised if Hunter x Hunter befell the same fate as Yu Yu Hakusho, though I certainly hope that it doesn't. Despite this understanding though, it doesn't make the frustration any less real watching a story you love fumble its remaining episode count. What makes the final section of this segment so frustrating is just how thoroughly it abandons everything we've spent 9 episodes setting up about as quickly as the story abandoned Kuwabara. But once again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Returning to the Yusuke bubble of the story, Ryzen is up in his acorn in the sky struggling against his hunger after nearly a year of Yusuke being there. Again, you see what I mean about the mention of that year not necessarily mattering? It's already over! In a better written story, we'd have gotten to see Yusuke grow physically, mentally, and emotionally over the course of that time. Ideally, we'd have gotten a lot more time with Hiei, Makuro, Kurama, and Yomi too. Imagine all of the character development and interpersonal relationship growth we missed out on, especially when you consider how condensed the timelines for the Dark Tournament and Chapter Black were. Think about just how much went down in those arcs, and those happened over the course of mere days. We just skipped forward a year in a matter of episodes. Anyway, outside, Yusuke trains with the Ball Street Boys and makes relatively quick worth of them, all of that effort we never got to see finally paying off. Yay! After his victory, Hokushin and the others rub salt in the wound by commenting that it's hard to believe Yusuke is the same boy who arrived a year ago while going a step further to say he's at least twice as strong as before. Would have been great to see all that! Yusuke runs off to attempt to fight Ryzen again, despite being reminded that Ryzen nearly killed him the previous month. One of the men remarks the oddity of Ryzen's <laughs> being off schedule, which causes panic amongst Hokushin's crew. Oh no! The pain of hunger and malnourishment has become so severe that Ryzen attacks Yusuke on sight in a blind fury, carrying his ancestral son through the air and declaring his need to feed. After crash landing in a forest, the combination of Yusuke's doubled strength and Ryzen's weakening body give Yusuke enough wiggle room to defend himself. Despite this, Ryzen manages to do a chomp before getting flipped to the ground. Yusuke snaps Ryzen out of his hunger-fueled rage by calling him pathetic, but then goes on to empathize with the man saying that if he needs to feed, he should. Yusuke goes on to say that he'd even be willing to bring him humans, specifically really evil ones, before continuing to empathize. If you need to eat humans to survive, so be it. I'll bring some for you, some real evil ones. The world is mixed up. Things I was clear on just confuse me now. But if what you do is wrong, then why were you made that way? Yusuke's come a very long way since his first case, and it's nice to see that the questions that were posed in Chapter Black remained a part of his growth. He's also clearly fumbling with the question of demon hunger versus human morality. These beings didn't ask to be born or created with a hunger for humans, so who are we to decide that their primal nature is wrong? Is it because we're the ones on the dinner plate? How is it any different from a lion eating a gazelle? We don't scold wolves for hunting and eating their prey, nor the eagle for eating the field mouse. The complication comes from Yusuke's subconscious knowledge that demons do not need to only sustain themselves on humans. As far as we know, neither Kurama nor Hiei consume humans to live, and at the beginning of the arc itself, we're told that humans are simply the preferred way to satiate a demon's hunger. 
That's what brings morality into the matter, the fact demons choose to eat humans. Yusuke asks Ryzen to tell him exactly what it was that made him swear off eating humans, and that's when we get the story of a human woman whose temper got him to fall in love. To be honest, I kinda hate the I stopped eating humans because I fell for one explanation. It doesn't feel satisfying, especially after the mystery of Ryzen refraining from consumption and the ruckus it caused for the others. I know the power of boners is strong, but I don't know, this just feels like a pretty remarkable fumble narratively. In a nutshell, 700 years ago during the feudal era, before the first Kakai barrier was raised, demons and humans kind of lived side by side, with humans definitely getting the raw end of the deal on that one. Ryzen was injured after being pursued by an angry mob and ended up breaking into a woman's house. She wasn't afraid of him and even patched him up. When she laid down to sleep, Ryzen had intended to kill and eat her, but she was a medicine woman and relayed to him that her blood was full of toxins that, if ingested, would leave him dead by daylight. She calls him out, basically saying do it if you're real, and after he doesn't, the two sleep together. The next morning, Ryzen convinces himself that he isn't worthy of her and dips out, swearing to never eat another human until he sees her again. But unfortunately, she ended up dying during childbirth, and bada bing bada boom a few dozen generations later, we get our favorite speed bump. After this, Ryzen gives Yusuke some much needed information about the ongoing power struggle. He tells him that back in the day he used to fight Yomi and Makuro just for the sake of fighting, but clearly things have changed. Surprisingly, he says Yusuke could get along with Makuro since Makuro simply wants Demon World to remain as it is, chaotic and divided. A traditionalist and isolationist by nature, Ryzen says that Makuro won't bother with spirit or human world. Then, he warns Yusuke to beware of Yomi, saying that his push for unification is simply a charade to move his army around, and that if the opportunity arose, Yomi wouldn't hesitate to go after the neighboring realms. It paints an interesting picture of the remaining rulers, but once again leaves us wishing we'd gotten to see the Three Kings interact with one another, both in the past when they were just battle buddies, and in the present day when they're now enemies. I genuinely believe that would have made this conflict so much more gripping, since the three could have served as parallels to Yusuke, Kurama, and Hiei by visualizing how different their friendship could have turned out, as well as how catastrophic a power struggle between our three boys would have been if it had taken place in human world. Based on the facts as he sees them, Ryzen instructs Yusuke to side with Makuro in the conflict as it is his inheritance and his duty. And then Ryzen promptly dies. Ryzen's death is played like a dramatic moment, which it is for the sake of the overall narrative, but it rings hollow since we've gotten basically no time as the audience to connect with him or see his daily interactions with Yusuke or even Hokushin. Sure, it's narratively sad, but it's emotionally pretty empty. Yusuke fills Ryzen's followers in on his death before asking Hokushin to take him to Yomi's kingdom. With Ryzen dead, Kurama advises Yomi to wait a little while just to guarantee their assumptions are correct. Hiei informs Makuro of the king's demise, and Makuro intends to follow through with her earlier plan of striking Yomi's kingdom with the full force of her army. Yusuke, after being informed about Yomi's insane hearing, decides to politely announce his arrival. <sighs> Yomi! You son of a bitch! You hear me? I'm coming, so boil up a kettle of tea! Yomi seems amused by this, but Kurama is most certainly not. He knows Yusuke and Yomi very well, and he knows if Yusuke makes the wrong move or says the wrong thing, the entire situation could go sideways in the blink of an eye. Hiei gives Makuro the rundown on Yusuke's actions before low-key hyping him up, which causes Makuro to question where Hiei's loyalties lie. Makuro presses Hiei if he'd side with her or Yusuke if it came down to brass tacks, but doesn't get a straight answer. Yomi had Yuda sent word to his forces at the gate to let Yusuke and Hokushin pass without any trouble, but instructs him to measure Yusuke's power level, which ends up clocking in around 200,000. Yomi then gives Kurama the order to have Chu and the others on standby in the room beside the meeting place. In the event Yusuke tries anything slick, he tells Kurama he won't hesitate to give the assassination order. Kurama is definitely not keen on that idea given his long-standing friendship with the former spirit detective as well as his own objective to keep Demon World from collapsing in on itself from the power struggle. Kurama's growing more and more concerned that Yusuke's reckless nature might be the catalyst that sends Demon World plunging into all-out war. Hiei and Makuro sneak into the city, getting incredibly close to the meeting place so that they can see how it unfolds for themselves. Hiei comments on the lack of a welcome party, but Makuro remarks that Yomi knows they're there and that they'd have known right away if he didn't want them to be. Yomi shows up for the meeting with Yusuke, and we can see that literally one room over, Kurama and the others are lying in wait. However, to subvert Yomi's insane sense of hearing, they've taken to writing notes. Despite the seriousness of the order Yomi could very well give them, they're all quite happy to see Yusuke, particularly Chu and Jin. Toya asks Kurama what they'll do if Yomi does decide to give the order. Kurama relays that he's been thinking the same thing, and while he's sworn allegiance to Yomi, and as much as he'd enjoy sparring with Yusuke again, he does not want to fight to the death with his friend. Kurama is torn on the matter, so he asks them all if it came down to it, who would they all side with, Yomi or Yusuke? Pretty unanimously, the answer is Yusuke, because it has to be. There's really no room for nuance with the minor characters in this arc. 
Yomi asks Yusuke to be direct about why he's there, and Yusuke wastes no time getting down to business. Well, Ryzen is dead now, and you know as the new king on the block, I thought it'd only be fair for me to tell you in person exactly how I'm gonna rip you off your throne. Yomi begins to power up, seeing Yusuke's words as a direct threat, and everyone goes on high alert, ready to intervene at a moment's notice if need be. Before things can pop off though, Yusuke offers a gift to Yomi. Both Kurama and Yomi postulate that Yusuke couldn't be naive enough to extend a peace offering, so Yomi concludes it must be a trap of some sort and asks Yusuke to unveil the gift. That's when a ton of jewels go scattering, to which Hokusha notices it's their entire national treasury, which would have been funny if we'd been shown these jewels earlier. This confuses Yomi, who begins to assume it's a genuine peace offering from Yusuke, concluding that if such is the case, Yusuke will be easier to beat than he thought. However, Yomi discovers that the beads have names carved into them, names like Hokushin, Makuro, Kurama, Hiei, etc. This isn't really important, but something that always makes me laugh is when Yusuke first unveils the beads, there's a huge pile of them, but just a few cuts later, there's basically nothing. Continuity errors like this in animation always crack me up. Yusuke explains that just because he's Ryzen's heir doesn't mean he's qualified to take up the mantle and lead an entire kingdom, let alone the entirety of Demon World. He floats the idea that maybe it's time to find another way to determine who gets to run things, and... <sighs> he proposes a tournament in which participants represent themselves and not a kingdom. The winner of said tournament would then go on to lead Demon World for an agreed upon period of time until the cycle restarts and they hold the tournament all over again. The idea is to effectively create a system of governance for Demon World with a rotating leader, though realistically all this would really boil back down to is the strongest of the strong duking it out. However, the nature of the conflict between just these three demons ends up creating questions later on by the tournament's conclusion, so I'll cycle back to this particular point later. Yomi initially scoffs at the idea of a tournament, but then Jin and the others make their presence known, showing enthusiasm for Yusuke's idea. Naturally, Yusuke is ecstatic to see his old friends again, and honestly, their tiny reunion is incredibly wholesome and I love it. Kurama steps in and catches Yomi off guard by making it clear that if Yomi doesn't go along with Yusuke's idea, that none of them will hesitate to take Yusuke's side over his. Still watching from afar, Hiei gets a kick out of the situation and Makuro accepts Yusuke's terms, much to Yomi's disbelief, effectively cornering him into agreeing. Thanks to this, word spread that the regimes led by the Three Kings have been dissolved, with the throne overseeing all of Demon World up for grabs. This is the point in the arc where my enjoyment of it begins to tank. I mean, we're coming off the heels of Chapter Black. It was complex, thought-provoking, and challenged our heroes in various and meaningful ways. The idea of three kingdoms locked in a power struggle with Yusuke, Kurama, and Hiei all on opposing sides for their own reasons was so intriguing. The political drama, scheming and backstabbing, and the stress it would have imposed on our heroes as well as their friendships was such a cool idea to go into the final arc with. On paper, it's an incredible setup for a potentially explosive finale. To have all of that potential traded in for another tournament arc left me feeling deflated the first time I saw it. On repeated viewings, it's so much worse because you can see all the details that had so much potential or built the world out more. But you gotta keep those feelings in check because you know it's all going to be tossed out the window in favor of a blindingly fast and deeply unsatisfying tournament. And unfortunately, with the exception of the finale, the Demon World tournament does take up the remaining episode count. Now, to be fair, there are a handful of important character moments for Yusuke, Hiei, and Kurama that do cap off their personal stories, but I would have preferred if they weren't confined to a tournament arc, especially one that isn't nearly as satisfying as the Dark Tournament. The stakes aren't even that high, we're watching the equivalent of Wrestlemania to see who gets to be Demon President for a while. And before anyone says, well, whoever ends up being Demon President can make up the rules and that could be bad for Spirit World and Human World, don't forget that Kurama's whole goal was preserving the balance between the realms. So if someone nasty ended up in charge, Kurama and his crew would just do what they were going to do from the start and move pieces behind the scenes to ensure that things pan out. That portion of Kurama's story is like a built-in safety net. There's so much that could have made this arc better, and I intend to go into more detail about what I would have changed to make the Three Kings a more suitable farewell to the series in an upcoming project I'm calling Rewrite. I'll basically be putting my own storytelling skills to the test as a writer to rework the Three Kings arc as a whole. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and you hit the bell icon so that you're ready when that massive project drops. Eventually. To prepare for the tournament and give himself the best possible chance for victory, Yomi has Yuta cook up a son for him. That way, even if Yomi goes down, if his son ends up victorious, then he still has an avenue to assert his influence. Back at Yusuke's camp, Hokushin shows concern over Yusuke's prospects for victory. As such, despite what Yusuke told them, the Ball Street Boys all intend to fight on Yusuke's behalf, raising his chances of ending up the ruler. 
Not long after their exchange, Enki and Coco, former friends of Ryzen, show up to pay their respects to the late king. At Ryzen's grave, Enki explains that when Ryzen swore off eating humans and stopped fighting, it went against everything they stood for. They took it as an insult, so they cut ties with him and left. Some pretty shady friends if you ask me, but okay. A bunch of others show up to also pay their respects, and it's supposed to be a somber scene, but I genuinely don't care that these people are sad. They were introduced mere moments ago, how am I expected to empathize with them? Not to mention, Ryzen had basically zero screen time himself until it was time for him to talk about a booty call and die, so I wasn't connected to him either. Yusuke tells Hokushin that seeing Ryzen through the eyes of the people who showed up to mourn him made him feel proud of his father, but this moment isn't earned. He even starts his remark by saying, I really didn't get to know him at all. Yeah, neither did the audience, Yusuke. Except Yusuke had an entire year to try to get to know this man and spent the entire time not doing that. Yusuke went to Demon World for answers about his heritage and what that means for his future, but then spent every waking moment just trying to kill Ryzen. You don't get to suddenly pretend that Yusuke didn't have any opportunities to connect with the old man, show. Unsurprisingly, Enki reveals that everyone that arrived also intends to take part in Yusuke's tournament. The group flexes their combined power, which gets the attention of Makuro, Karama's team, and even Yomi, who mentions that each of Ryzen's allies is close in power to him. Keep this statement in mind. With the tournament being an open invitation, drawing participants from far and wide with aspirations of becoming the new overlord of Activision Blizzard, naturally, the roster reaches a ridiculous number. That number being 6,272 to be specific. With this many participants, a typical tournament would take an unholy amount of time, and Yusuke finds out from Chu and the others that the combatants have been divided into groups of 49 for battle royale style matches. The winner from each group will advance to the tournament proper, which will leave 128 contestants to engage in one-on-one -on -one combat. Yomi arrives with Shura, who is fresh out of the Easy Bake Oven, and Makuro arrives where she reveals to the world that she is, in fact, a woman. Shura begins to display his petulance by dismissing both Makuro and Yusuke before making Yomi promise that if they end up fighting, he won't hold back or go easy just because Shura is his son. Just by this comment alone, anyone with a working brain can easily guess that these two are fated to face each other. Yusuke, Kurama, and Hiei have a brief reunion where Yusuke mentions that if he and Kurama ended up in the same group, it would be the first time they fought each other, which I think would be a fun matchup that I'm kind of sad we never got to see. Then Yusuke and Hiei poke a bit of fun at each other, which I'm always here for. Best Girl Kodo returns to host the tournament and she's joined by Yuta's gremlin ass. During the lottery drawing to determine which fighters are in which groups, everyone ends up escaping the scenario of having to fight each other with the exception of two. Hokushin and the Bald Street Boys, sponsored by Keeps, all somehow end up in the same group, and just mathematically, the odds of that happening should have been incredibly low. But considering they're all just copy-paste of the same personified egg, I'll give it a pass. Maybe if any of them were actual characters, with Hokushin hitting the absolute bare minimum of characterization, then I'd be more invested. And the other, right out the gate, is Yomi and Shura ending up in the same group, which is also pretty unlikely. The odds on favor to win the whole shebang is universally considered to be split between either Yomi or Makuro, so you already know neither of them walk away with a crown. Right before the group battles officially begin, we're told that a long list of participants dropped out voluntarily. Yuta hypothesizes that most of them likely belong to the groups containing Yomi and Makuro, with the dropouts not wanting to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the two titans. Every one of Ryzen's former allies make it through, one of which defeats Chu along the way, somehow making him the only one of Kurama 6 that got disqualified before the tournament proper. Even Shishi and Suzuka make it through. Gotta say, feels bad, man. Considering the punchline of his loss was, haha, pretty girl is pretty, he could have easily been swapped for Shishi Wakamaru, who, let's admit, isn't anyone's favorite character. Not to mention, we've seen him simp for Genkai when she was in her young and pretty form during the Dark Tournament, so it would make sense for Shishi, easily the lamest of this group, to be the one to lose in this way. I genuinely hate that Chu didn't even really get any time to shine after all is said and done. I wanted another moment that was as epic as the Knife Edge deathmatch, but I guess I I'm, I'm guess I'm just an idiot for wanting that. Makuro makes it through because literally everyone in her group dropped out, Hiei and Kurama make it through their rounds as well, in Yusuke's match, the demons intend to jump him to get him out of the match first before turning on each other, however, Yusuke tears through them without breaking much of a sweat. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've been going through the preliminaries at a breakneck speed. This isn't necessarily just me trying to condense the information, the show is flying through these moments like a bat out of hell too. It tells you what happens in the unimportant fights, or shows you tiny slivers of interesting matchups so that it can get right to the most important fights. There are quite literally only four fights in this entire tournament that both matter narratively and also show us the battle in their entirety. 
Everything else is just padding and set dressing to make you think the stakes are higher. It's grandiose visually, but devoid of the same kind of storytelling that was present in the Dark Tournament. We're supposed to believe that anyone can come out on top of the thousands of participants, but a very select handful are even properly named characters, so that narrows our pool. Most of Ryzen's allies never even had their names said out loud or had any real moments to be a character, so we know we can rule out nearly every one of them. We know from the power creep alone that none of Kurama's six are anywhere close to being strong enough to snatch the crown, so it won't be any of them. We know it won't be any of the Bald Street Boys, because they all ended up in the same group, with Hokushin being the strongest among them, and we've already been shown that Hokushin is a one-trick pony. We've also been shown that Yusuke can handily defeat them nowadays, and with most of the heavy hitters being on par with or above Yusuke, that drops their chances to zero. In that same vein, in the Power Creep column, that leaves both Hiei and Kurama in a tough spot too. While we don't get a number for Hiei, we saw that Yoko clocks in around 150k, and Yusuke clocks in around 200k. And while I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself to say this, Hiei does stand his ground in his fight with Makuro, but it's still a pretty one-sided fight. Even if he removed Hiei's motives from that fight, I genuinely believe he'd have still lost. I don't believe Kurama would be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Yomi either, even if he did rely on Yoko. Yomi being stronger than him was part of the tension of their agreement. Of the three, only Yusuke is strong enough to genuinely throw hands with anyone on par with the remaining kings. So that narrows our prospective victors to Yusuke, Makuro, Yomi, and those among Ryzen's allies that had any real screen time. But even then, you know Makuro and Yomi won't win because of the implications the story already set up. You can guess that Yusuke probably won't win because the story is almost over and his victory would mean that there's more story to be told, not to mention Yusuke made the commitment to go back to Human World. Winning the tournament would prevent him from keeping his promise to Keiko. That genuinely only leaves one of Ryzen's people, which isn't ideal. You don't even need to have seen how the anime ends to jump to these conclusions, you just need to be paying attention. That's what makes all of this so frustrating. It's a bunch of hoopla that could have been done better if it wasn't bound by the structure of a tournament. An all-out war between the kingdoms would have been far more compelling. But anyway, I've gotten ahead of myself again. Back to the tournament. Yomi and Shura's fight kicks off with an explosive start from one of Shura's attacks that's shut down by a barrier Yomi can conjure that absorbs incoming demon energy. Honestly, this fight doesn't really do much for me for two reasons. One, we literally just met Shura, so we have zero investment in whether he wins or loses. Not to mention, from what we have seen of him, he's kind of an asshole. So we're already actively rooting against him. If Shura had been present from the beginning of the arc, and we got to see the kind of relationship he had with Yomi, whether good or bad, we'd have more of an emotional tether to this battle. Any emotional attachment is further compromised by the fact we saw Yomi cook this boy up in a test tube instead of him raising an actual child over time after losing his sight. This lack of context, insight, or any real emotional link for the audience is literally the Rise and Yusuke problem all over again. 2. I feel like it's way too early in the tournament's lifespan for this fight to be taking place. This should have easily fallen further down the tournament bracket, giving us time to watch Shura defeat others, thus bolstering his confidence before ending up in the unfortunate predicament of squaring off with his father. This would have given us some much needed insight into his methods, whether he was brutal, cruel, merciful, compassionate, naive, etc. For Shura to be placed on the chessboard as some incredibly important piece, just to be knocked out of the competition in his very first fight, kind of makes me wonder what the point of introducing him even was. Something we will definitely be correcting in our rewrite of this arc later on. Now, the entire point of this fight, as vocalized by Kurama, isn't for Yomi to crush Shira. Instead, it's to teach him not to make the same mistakes that Yomi made in his youth. He's trying to get Shira to recognize when a fight is over and when to accept defeat. Thematically, I really like this because of the parallels it draws between the past and present. In that moment, we see just how far Yomi has come not only in terms of power, but in patience and other important virtues. He's built an entire kingdom on the back of the lessons he had to learn the hard way, and like most parents, he wants to teach those lessons to his son before the world gets the chance to teach those same lessons, but in a much crueler way. Unfortunately, my previous complaints robbed this narrative story beat of the weight it could have had. I still love what it does and what it has to say, but it just doesn't have the same punch that it should have. This fight would have been a slam dunk if it had just happened later on in the tournament. After this battle finally concludes with Shura conceding, Yusuke takes to the stage to address the crowd. He proposes that they avoid as much loss of life as possible simply because he thinks it would be a shame if he only met some of them once, and that he's sure they'd all prefer to live to fight another day. The demons seem a bit confused, but as we'll see, the participants do end up acclimating to this, which is necessary so that tons of established characters aren't just dying left and right. The first official match of the tournament goes to Yusuke and your typical furry. It ends just as quickly as you'd imagine. 
Immediately after this, we find out from Jin and Toya that Suzuka had already lost his match as they and Yusuke watch Shishi lose his match against Tokushin. Suzuka's fight takes place entirely off screen and we only witness the tail end of Shishi's. This kind of thing annoys the life out of me since emphasis was placed on training up these exact characters only for us to gloss over their battles. This is indicative of both the pacing as well as the lack of a focused vision for this arc. The main tournament just started and including the current episode, there are only 4.5 episodes remaining dedicated to wrapping up these battles. The last episode and a half of the series are primarily focused on wrap up, leaving the audience feeling rushed along. There's no time for any of these battles to be gripping or insightful, save for a few, and we don't really get to see any of the named characters grow in any meaningful ways aside from our headliners. Next up, we roll into the Jin vs Soketsu fight, and considering Soketsu is one of Ryzen's old buddies and was part of the group that demonstrated the massive spike of power earlier, we already know that Jin stands no chance. From the audience's point of view, that's such a bummer! Just like Chu, Jin is a fan favorite, so the joy of having him back on screen is voided by just how one-sided this fight ends up being. Predictably, Jin gets manhandled by Soketsu even though he does manage to land one tornado fist. With all the time Genkai spent training Jin and the others, it's kind of ridiculous that none of them seem to have gained any new tricks that could have made their battles more even. This is also why measuring their power levels earlier was pointless, since they were all just going to end up cannon fodder anyway. The rising power creep of the cast made it so that all of their training was ultimately irrelevant, regardless of what number was spat out by some random device. I know I have my gripes about Hunter x Hunter, but at least the Nen system made for some spectacular battles that became the equivalent of puzzles for characters to navigate through at times. A weaker fighter could still potentially carve out a path to victory if they played smart enough. However, the power creep of the S-Class demons nullifies any clever tactics the character might have otherwise relied upon to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. That complexity of combat is a key component that's absent from the Demon World tournament. It's sincerely frustrating to watch. The only interesting thing to come out of this battle was the sportsmanlike conduct from Soketsu that Yusuke was hoping to see from the participants. It shows that, at the very least, even S-Class demons are open to changing. Soketsu himself also expresses to a now unconscious Jin that under different circumstances, things could have ended a lot worse for the Windmaster. Next up is Toya vs Kuju, another of Ryzen's old buddies. So we already know who's going to take the L here. Unlike Jin's fight, we don't get to watch it from start to finish. We land right in the middle of the fight where the two are making snarky quips at one another. Also unlike Jin, Toya does appear to get the upper hand on Kuju with his ice techniques. To me, on my initial watch, this harkened back to what Hiei said about him during the Dark Tournament, how if there was anyone that was truly a master of their craft, it was Toya, as he's more disciplined than his peers. But even this initial reaction for me proved to be wrong in just a few moments. Kuju gets stuck in Toya's ice and it proceeds to sap his power. Toya grinds him down a bit with his shards of winter attack before going in for a decisive blow. Unsurprisingly, Kuju breaks free from the ice, to which Toya questions how he even has enough demon energy left to do so. Kuju says he used the last of his energy to bust free, but Toya quickly discerns that That was a fucking lie. Kuju apparently allowed the ice to soak up just enough power for him to be even with Toya, again bringing the power creep issue back to the forefront. Also why? There's legitimately no merit to letting this happen. Especially since after fighting for a few more moments, Toya just straight up passes out anyway. I don't really know why Toya's battery suddenly ran out here. He never hints that any of his techniques are using more energy than others. He just flops over. <laughs> It's also impossible to gauge just how long this fight's been running since we didn't get to see it begin, and the arc itself has been kind of blasé about helping the audience understand the passage of time. There's a little more to this fight regarding Toya's newly discovered philosophy on fighting thanks to his encounter with Team Urameshi during the previous tournament, but it's pretty poorly executed through some clunky dialogue. And with most things in this arc, it's a factor that's introduced way too late for it to be poignant in the moment it's supposed to. So, so much of the Demon World tournament feels this way. As we proceed, during a recap given to us by the narrator, we're informed that Rinku was also sidelined, but I don't recall anyone mentioning that. At least Suzuka and the others were mentioned in some way. Rinku was relegated to the narrator saying, oh, by the way, Yo-Yo Kid is out too. Ooh, spoopy. I could be overlooking some dialogue. It was difficult to not zone out during several portions of this. But with that, I guess everyone from Genkai's training camp is officially out. If I was Yomi and heard how these six had performed, I'd have several questions for Karama. Speaking of Karama, this episode begins with him making a phone call to his mother where he apologizes for being selfish. He tells her he's been doing a lot of thinking about the future, which we as the audience know is in reference to the internal struggle between his three personas. There's a mention of a cherry tree Karama used to climb every day as a child, and we again see just how much these memories mean to him. This sets the stage for the coming clash with his opponent, who is a restored Shigure. 
On his approach to the designated arena, Yomi confronts Kurama and expresses he understands that the Spirit Fox never plans for just one outcome. He's always calculating and assessing situations to plan for a number of outcomes. Kurama expresses that doing so is how he survived all this time, and our time spent with Kurama throughout the series does back that up. Yomi then goes on to somewhat absolve Kurama of his betrayals, saying that he's learned a lot from them and that he no longer feels bad about the past. In their own way, it's a reconciliation of their grievances as they both look to the future. I do wish there had been more to this, but given we're almost out of episodes, it's whatever. Shigure can see in Kurama's eyes that he's got a very interesting life story, so he proceeds to ask him what it is he's working through. Without any hesitation, Kurama shuts that shit down. Shigure attempts to finish Kurama with a massive attack, but when the dust begins to clear, he sees that all he's managed to do is coax out Yoko. As the fox evades Shigure's phosphorus ring sword, he begins to reflect on his life. Kurama relays that he originally intended to follow his plan of leaving Human World when his demonic powers returned, but that he came to love his human mother as though she were his own true mother. The authentic bond that developed is what led him to nearly relinquish his life, making a wish to cure her of her illness. We then see him looking back on the memory that cemented his friendship with Yusuke, where he helped Kurama save his mother and lived to continue being her son. Then we get flashes of the people he's formed bonds with, including Kuwabara and Hiei, along with a group shot of our main cast. Kurama voices that he doesn't want any of them to miss him as he leaves that form behind, saying he cannot betray his true self any longer. At first glance, the phrasing and visuals are ambiguous enough to kind of trick you into thinking Kurama has decided to cast away the person we've come to know in order to stay true to who he was before, Yoko. However, mid-combat, he dismisses his Yoko form and returns to his base state, much to the surprise of Shigure and Yomi. What the dog doing? Kurama takes a nasty attack from Shigure, leaving him pretty heavily injured, but still willing to fight. Shigure notices plants have begun to emerge from the ground, to which Kurama reveals that a long time ago he planted the seeds of an Okaninju tree there. Even knowing how far in advance Kurama tends to shape his plans, and as much as I love it, this still feels like a bit of an ass pull to give him an out after refusing to resort to using Yoko's power. After this change, Shigure launches one final attack at Kurama, blowing through the many vines and branches being sent his way. Right before he would have connected with Kurama, a large tree branch comes in from behind and halts the forward momentum of the ring sword, trapping it in a way Shigure doesn't have time to free it from. We get a view of how dangerously close Shigure came to splitting Kurama's melon, and the demon surgeon disengages but is immediately cornered by viciously sharp branches which force him to surrender. Flower petals come falling from above, and we see that they're identical to the ones from the cherry tree mentioned in Kurama's phone call to his mother, giving the audience another hint as to the conclusion Kurama came to earlier. Shigure compliments the petals before telling Kurama to cherish them, which can be taken both literally and thematically for Kurama's character arc. The surgeon then proceeds to cure himself of the disease known as life by chucking himself off the tree because blah blah honor blah blah. Kurama loses consciousness after his victory and all of his friends, he included, rush out to him. The first to reach and retrieve him though is Yomi, who asks Kurama if he's truly abandoned his Yoko form, to which Kurama replies, Oh no, I never leave anything behind. I never have. I think this line was a great conclusion to his arc with Yomi. Given everything they've both been through and experienced both separately and together, there's a lot of layers to this one remark. On one hand, it's Kurama's way of saying that despite not being present, Yomi was still part of who he was and that, to some degree, Yomi may have been in his thoughts. Second, I also think it's Kurama's way of saying to Yomi that in his own way, he helped to guide Yomi into becoming the person he is now. Kurama left such a profound mark on the demon that Yomi himself basically became Kurama in a way. He learned to be patient, to be strategic, to seek the guidance of others when it came to making important decisions, he learned to lead, he basically cherry-picked all the best parts of who Kurama was, and it made him all the better. Not to mention, Kurama actually came back when he was summoned. Sure, it was a tense situation, but Kurama didn't run away from it even though he knew what he'd done to Yomi. Lastly, it tells us that while he has chosen to be Suichi from this point forward, he doesn't intend to forget the things that made him Kurama. I really wish we'd gotten to see this play out a bit more organically over a longer episode count because I very much enjoy the framework of Kurama and Yomi's shared arc. In the aftermath of Kurama's match, Koenma and Botan find themselves a bit concerned. Kurama's in pretty rough shape and most of his energy has been expended, giving them little faith he can come out on top in his next match. This forces them to wonder what happens if he loses, and then what could potentially happen if Yusuke and Hiei fail to win as well. From their perspective, their best chance at peace between the realms is for one of our boys to claim the crown. The next fight is Hiei vs Makuro, which is certainly among the very few battles that is actually always great to watch, not necessarily combat wise, but narratively. Hokushin gets bonked by Yusuke for remarking that Hiei vs Makuro works out in their favor since they're both formidable opponents. Yusuke reprimands him for this comment, explaining that it makes them look weak. In Yusuke's words, Maybe we do need help, but no one needs to know. 
Like his words before the main tournament, Yusuke is very much aware of the possibility he won't walk away with the dub, but he's not going to let that stop him from giving it his all. And his pride won't allow for Hokushin to voice their luck about two powerful opponents squaring off being in their best interest. The lack of true life or death stakes for him and his friends do afford him the luxury of being much more casual about their situation though. As Hiei's fight with Makuro commences, she asks him if his opinion of death remains the same, to which Hiei confirms that there's nothing left for him in this life. Makuro doesn't believe his claim and we begin diving into her backstory some more. With a handful of episodes left in the series, we're just now getting more insight into Makuro. While it is the equivalent of an 11th hour exposition dump, it works well enough for this to get a pass. It's just another issue that could have been remedied with a longer episode count and perhaps some anime exclusive scenes to flesh things out. When Makuro was still a child, she was sold into slavery and she relays that her first memories are of the shackles that can still be seen binding her. Eventually, she ran away from her captors, but unfortunately, despite her newfound freedom, she couldn't seem to free herself from her shackles. The shackles that remained on her became symbolic of the way she was being held captive by the darkness of her past. The scars of captivity had been seared into not just her flesh, but her spirit. This sense of spiritual imprisonment despite her physical freedom sowed the seeds of a deep hatred that eventually manifested in the form of violence as a warrior. This burning hatred only grew over time, earning her a ruthless reputation while also allowing her to grow strong enough to rival the other two kings. Hiei interrupts Makuro to get the fight started, asking her if she's so unhappy why not put herself out of her misery. Makuro's agility keeps her out of Hiei's reach, but she also doesn't counterattack just yet. Then we get a bit more insight from Hiei who explains that for his entire life he never got to experience the joy of being loved and that he even had to endure being hated and abandoned by his own people. He goes on to say that's why he felt she understood him, because they both tried to purge their pain through violence before following the statement with After all, we're both only capable of expressing ourselves through our violence. Makuro begins to fight back but is still pulling her punches. She even passes on an opportunity to strike Hiei when she catches him slipping. Hiei can't wrap his head around why someone with as savage of a reputation as her would change her tactics so drastically simply because she's fighting him. Hiei sees it as an insult, but it's clear to the audience that Makuro didn't mean for it to be that way. There's a very real connection that is formed between the two, mostly off screen, but a connection nonetheless. But like Hiei said earlier, they're only capable of expressing themselves through their violence, so if Makuro's got something to say, she's going to have to do the talking with her fists. Makuro accepts Hiei's bid to get her to fight more seriously and the first definitive strike of the match goes to her. I love the artwork for this moment because in my mind, that's what instant regret looks like. After tearing off his shirt that wasn't even really all that messed up, Hiei immediately retaliates with the Lizard of the Shadowfire. Makuro mentions the irony of Hiei being born a fire demon despite coming from a village of ice spirits. Hiei explains that it's his curse and burden to bear, being born with powers in direct opposition to that of his people, with flames made for consuming everyone and everything in his path with his hate. Hold it! Makuro calls bullshit and says that if it was hatred that drove him, he'd have destroyed the ice village when he found it. Your Honor, I object! And why is that, Mr. Reed? Because it's devastating to my case! Makuro then hits Hiei with a bit of truth that has been baked into his character from the beginning, but only really peeked out every now and then. It's not hatred! It's longing! You just want to belong to something! Hiei just keeps throwing hands, but is again called out by Makuro, who questions whether or not he's the one half-assing the fight, mirroring Hiei's attitude from earlier. Makuro draws attention to Hiei's Jigan eye, wanting him to use it to finally find what it is he was always truly looking for, lifting the veil for the audience even further. Hiei isn't one to talk about his true motives, he just does what he needs to do from the shadows, so it isn't impossible to believe that there is a hidden reason, a more emotionally and deeply lonely reason, he wanted the demonic implant. Part of finding his place of birth was likely in the hopes that he'd be accepted by his people. With that in mind, imagine how crushing it must have felt to be rejected by them a second time. Then pair that with the search for Yukina, finding the only person connected to his home that was wholly willing to accept him, being so close but unable to tell her who he was. The price he ultimately paid to get the very thing that allowed him to find his family was preventing him from claiming that connection he yearned for. It's kind of heartbreaking when you look back on all of his interactions with Yukina, and then when you consider how many times he was rejected, first by the ice apparitions and then by the bandits that raised him, it's no wonder he put up a wall that kept him from getting close to anyone. Back to the fight, we can see that Makuro can cut directly through the third dimension, which I don't even want to begin to try to understand how that works. Supposedly, anything that comes into contact with these tears in reality will also be split, but not really. At most, they seem like a mild inconvenience because we see Hiei collide with two of them and he's mostly fine afterward. Makuro proceeds to weave a net around Hiei and Kurama worries that if Hiei doesn't do something soon, he'll be torn to shreds. 
However, we literally just saw how ineffective these spatial terrors seem to be, and we also know that there's a lot more subtext to this fight that isn't all about the two killing each other. Even if it was, look how big these gaps are in this alleged net. Hiei could absolutely get out of there with as fast as he's proven himself to be, not to mention he's the size of a toddler. 65% of his height is his ego, 34% is his hair, and the remaining 1% is his actual body. Hiei opens his Jigan eye and unravels his bandages to launch a full powered Dragon of the Darkness Flame. Makuro braces against the dragon but is soon carried off into the air. There's a bit of a struggle from both sides, but Makuro ultimately ends up splitting the dragon in half with a wave of energy that travels along the length of the attack and smashes into Hiei. Makuro tells Hiei that until now, he wasn't strong enough to consciously control the dragon, saying that up until then, all he could do was feed on the intention of his soul. Hiei concedes to Makuro, and she tells him not to say that his only reason for living now was to one day defeat her, remarking that she couldn't bear it. However, Hiei tells her that she's missed his point, at which time the shackles that had bound her for basically her entire life begin to crack. Now you can leave your hatred in the past where it belongs. While Makuro was trying to force Hiei to admit that what he's really just been searching for this entire time was a family and place he belongs, as well as acknowledge the fact that there was still so much for him to live for, Hiei was simultaneously working to free her from her shackles both physically and mentally. It's easy to assume that Hiei did so because he saw so much of himself and how he used to be in Makuro. Despite his prickly exterior, Hiei has come a long way in terms of his relationships as well as the things he finds valuable. So spending all that time with and then facing Makuro must have been akin to being forced to look in the mirror and do some self-reflection. Hiei knew the only way to truly move forward and find the things he sought was to let go of the sorrow of the past, and he needed Makuro to understand that too. This is emphasized by the statement he makes before the episode ends. There are things in the future that are worth living for, both for you and for me. At the start of the next episode, we see that Makuro has squared up with Natsumi, the chick Chu was simping over and ultimately conceded to. From what we in the audience can tell, Natsumi seems to be giving Makuro a run for her money. Initially, and to some degree, I still think Makuro struggling to gain the upper hand on Natsumi is ridiculous, but I'll touch on this when I go back into my issues with Ryzen's friends overall here in just a bit. Regardless of my gripes to come, I do like the idea that Makuro has actually gotten weaker after Hiei freed her from the shackles of her past. The story doesn't really take the time to iron this out for the viewer until after the tournament has concluded though, so in the meantime, you're left to infer it with very few clues, which is what makes this matchup feel absurd. Shu, whose name I had to look up, and Saketsu are apparently in their 8th hour of a stalemate, again disrupting the audience's ability to follow the procession of time. Not to mention with as little screen time as Saketsu had with Jin, and Shu having essentially zero screen time at all, this isn't a battle I really care about in terms of the outcome. As you can probably tell by how things are rocketing forward, this tournament doesn't really have any true substance or meat to it in the action category. Excluding this episode, there are only two left, so there's no time to linger on anything other than Yusuke by this point. So now we come to Yusuke vs Yomi, which takes up the remainder of the tournament despite it not being the final match. Right off the bat, Yusuke can feel the massive difference in power between Yomi and himself. He even goes so far as to say that he's actually closer in power to Shura than he is to Yomi, which is a weird downplay, especially considering how this match turns out. Yusuke lets his demon energy erupt from him, surprising the audience with his strength, but Yomi casually flexes his own energy which pushes back the tide. Yusuke has to put out even more effort just to keep up. Their colliding energy goes shooting up into the atmosphere and the other combatants take note of it. Interestingly, and stupidly as we'll see later, this massive surge in power actually inspires the other fighters to kick it up a notch during their own battles. Eventually, Yomi's insane output begins to push Yusuke towards the edge of the ring. Just before he'd fall out, Yomi dispels his aura and calmly takes a fighting stance, inviting Yusuke for hand-to-hand -hand combat. By the reaction of Kurama and Hiei, Yusuke engaging in melee combat with a former ruler would be an incredibly bad idea. I said, do you wanna fight me? Do you wanna catch his hands? To everyone's surprise though, Yusuke is the first to make contact, catching Yomi with a clean strike to the face. However, Yomi let Yusuke punch him on purpose because that's his kink and we won't shame him for it. The fight begins for real Z's this time and Yomi immediately claims the upper hand. Oddly enough, while being pummeled by one of Yomi's attacks, Yusuke begins to realize that something is wrong. Despite the strength of the attacks, he doesn't seem to feel any of it. Yusuke remarks that he feels empty, and even the people watching can tell something is wrong, having never seen such a lifeless look in his eyes. Yomi picks up on it too, commenting that there's no way that a weak attack could have done this to the boy. He knows something else is draining the passion out of Yusuke. Yusuke conveys that he'd suddenly come to the realization that he doesn't know what he's fighting for anymore. This statement pisses Yomi off, and honestly, same. 
As Yomi is understandably kicking the piss out of our boy because he's annoyed, Yusuke has an internal monologue where he states that he'd spent his entire life fighting and being angry. He gave everything he had against Taguro and Sensui, but as Yusuke points out, it was for their reasons. They were both looking for someone to take their lives. Now Yusuke is in a predicament where he's not sure what his reason to fight is. He's not angry anymore and questions what his life has been building up to, wondering if he's just looking for someone else to come along and take his life in the same way as his previous adversaries. The Force Ghost of Ryzen comes along to remind Yusuke that he came to Demon World to reconcile his identity, figure out what part Ryzen plays, and determine what Yusuke's purpose going forward is. I genuinely hate this entire segment for several reasons. One, it comes out of absolutely nowhere. There's no real setup to this, there's no breadcrumbs, it just happens. We don't get any indication from Yusuke at all during the tournament that he feels like he's lost his way or lost sight of what it is he fights for. There's no emotional resonance with this scene because there was no lead up. If we'd seen Yusuke struggling internally or losing his love of fighting over the course of the tournament, that would have hit harder. But up until the moment he needed to start freaking out, he's basically just been his normal self. 2. Yusuke has already spent so much time in Demon World, has witnessed the death of Ryzen, and you mean to tell me that he either A. completely forgot what his original tension of coming here was, or B. never took the time to reflect on his objectives, what he's learned, and come to any kind of conclusion? 3. Yusuke's objectives are things that should have been thoroughly explored over the course of the arc, not just speedrun at the very end. Just like with so many things, it becomes impossible to feel invested in a character when the show doesn't even make time to properly invest in its characters anymore. The arc started off relatively strong, but the sudden inclusion of a tournament arc basically forced every story thread to the side until things needed to be wrapped up. If themes of identity, the past, present, and future are supposed to be the main focal points, the last thing we needed was a blindingly fast tournament arc. If we'd spent the year with Yusuke, we could have seen him grapple with some of these issues. If we'd gotten to see Yusuke adapting to the trials of having to step into the role of a ruler, we could have seen him struggling with the concept of simply waiting for someone to come take his life the way he referenced. With Yomi and Makuro, and perhaps many others, gunning to dethrone the inexperienced new king and conquer his land, it would have organically brought upon this line of thinking. This could have believably led to him wondering if this was what he truly wanted, what he was fighting for, and if this was just his life now. In that position, it would have made more sense for him to question these things and tie them back to his previous enemies. 4. In terms of Yusuke losing sight of what he's fighting for, he has to know just how important this tournament is considering it was his idea. Even more so considering it was springboarded off the back of the inevitable power vacuum in the wake of Ryzen's death. By proxy, he has to be aware that this tournament can have grave ramifications for all three realms if the wrong demon wins. Even though we know Yusuke wasn't confident he would come out on top the way he did in the Dark Tournament, he should still be fighting toward the best possible outcome of putting someone trustworthy on the throne, regardless of if it ends up being him or not. Ryzen himself mentioned how dangerous Yomi could be to the neighboring realms before the demon died, so that should have been an important- <laughs> Same thing I did last time, I said important, like I'm fucking Bugs Bunny. Ryzen himself mentioned how dangerous Yomi could be to the neighboring realms before the demon died, so that should have been an important point of concern. As you can tell, this scene just rubs me wrong with how clunky it is both in its delivery and its weird timing. Anyway, after this, Yusuke gets another good bonk on Yomi and the fight continues. But now, Yusuke is sporting the same tribal marks of the Mazuku that he had at the end of Chapter Black, having finally fully integrated his demon heritage. Somehow. In a nod back to an earlier portion of the fight that I skipped, Yusuke and Yomi run at one another but Yusuke disappears from view, reversing the way this exact action played out before. Yusuke comes in from the side with a massive spirit gun, though since it's demon energy I guess it's technically a demon gun. As was the case with Shura's fight, Yomi managed to avoid harm from Yusuke's Babazooka using his demon absorption wall technique. Yusuke begins firing his demon gun at the barrier despite Yomi reminding him that it wards off all demon energy. However, in a legitimately clever solution, Yusuke begins infusing each blast with particles of spirit energy, allowing those particles to pass through the barrier and strike Yomi. He ramps up the amount of spirit energy until eventually the mark of the Mazuku fades and he's once again blasting off rounds from his handy dandy spirit gun. Yusuke and Yomi actually have a nice exchange in the aftermath of a devastating blast from the spirit gun. It's framed well, the dialogue works, and the music sells the vibe that we are, in fact, closing in on the end. Unfortunately, this moment is sharply undercut by the lingering feeling that we didn't get here organically. Even though this moment feels really good, it's handicapped by the mediocrity that came before it. Had this been the culmination of an arc full of trials and tribulations, it would have felt far more genuine. When the two square off again, Yomi apologizes for underestimating Yusuke's strength. Sorry about that. I guess I just don't know my own strength. 
And I do humbly apologize for underestimating it as well. Perhaps you aren't such a pale substitute for a fight with your demon father after all, Yusuke. There's a real sense of mutual respect here before the final throwdown commences. And when it does, both men appear to be wholeheartedly enjoying themselves and the thrill of the fight. The fight goes on, it's flashy, they punch each other, yada yada yada. Eventually, we get a bunch of commentary from the onlookers, as well as a stark reminder that Kuwabara has been painfully absent from this entire arc. Yusuke reflects on Genkai's words from the Dark Tournament, where she tells him that he can't be a cocky kid anymore. We see a lot of the people Yusuke has befriended along his journey with a line from Genkai that finally solidifies the answer Yusuke truly needed. You're fighting for them, Yusuke. For their future. And then Yusuke proceeds to expel tons of yellow energy. Considering Chapter Black really wasn't all that long ago, you could be forgiven for thinking, oh snap, this must be sacred energy. Maybe there was more than one way to reach it. Well good for you, you're wrong. Koenma himself even says this energy is actually something brand new. They don't say what it is, it just suddenly appears. A mystery energy. In the penultimate episode. Cool. The pair have another exchange here that never fails to amuse me. You can't end a good party without someone on the floor. I suppose not. The fight comes to a dramatic conclusion with a pair of simultaneous punches to each other's faces. Yusuke takes his freshly acquired concussion and decides it's time for a nap. As Koto does the count, Yusuke struggles to his feet only to find himself in a hospital bed where he's visited by Chu and the others. They tell Yusuke that he's been unconscious for a week and that Yomi narrowly prevailed over him. Initially, Yomi was on a quick route to taking a nap in the dirt beside Yusuke, but hearing Shura cry out for him willed him to remain standing and emerge the victor. Chu mentions that Yusuke's fight with Yomi changed the way everyone else fought too, likely in a similar capacity to how we saw it affect Makro and Suketsu's respective fights. Kurama arrives and informs Yusuke that the tournament has ended and the former detective has conveniently awoken right as the winner is on stage. The winner, you ask? It, 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 it was Enki, it, it was this guy. What? No, I'm serious. A fighter we never actually got to see fight or do much of anything aside from pay his respects to Ryzen. By now, there's no point for me to relitigate why I hate that anyone from Ryzen's camp won, but oh well. At least of everyone, we probably got to see the most personality from Enki, but the bar was astonishingly low. This feels anticlimactic because we skipped over a great deal of fights that involved supposedly important side characters. They weren't even red herrings because we never got to see them running the scoreboard. All of this hoopla is just narrative housekeeping, like seriously, does anybody care about this tournament? We find out from Kurama that Yomi lost in the very next fight after his bout with Yusuke. His injuries and depleted energy ended up costing him the fight against someone Kurama said he had no business losing to. So, even though Yusuke lost, he still secured the win over Yomi in the grand scheme of things. Which was something he would have consciously been trying to do in a better written iteration of this, but here it just seems to have been a happy accident. Makuro gave her all against Natsumi, won, but then was too tuckered out to defeat Enki. Again, it was marvelously convenient that Yusuke's fight inspired everyone else to go all out and waste loads of energy in fights that weren't even the finals. Sometimes brain damage is contagious. Conveniently, Enki establishes just one grand law as the new leader. No more mischief in human world. So there you go. It all worked out because the story needs to end in the next episode. Yomi leaves to go off on a journey of self-discovery with Shura and tells Kurama he respects his decision to leave his past behind, while also expressing his thanks for Kurama taking up his invitation. Yomi's gotten a lot of character development in this incredibly short arc, rivaled only by the amount of development that Hiei was surprisingly given. Everyone says their goodbyes as Yusuke and Kurama prepare to return to Living World. Kurama and Hiei have an exchange that's probably one of my favorite jokes in the entire series. Hiei intends to stay in Demon World and wants Kurama to tell Yukina that her long lost brother has been dead for years. He then asks Kurama to give Yukina his personal stone, but Kurama refuses to close that door for Hiei. Yusuke and Koenma have one more talk with each other and we're given another reminder of Kuwabara's absence. But, at least in the context of the scene, it's a great callback to the beginning of the series as well as the friendship that grew between Yusuke and Kuwabara. Koenma remarks that Yusuke's termination as Spirit Detective is permanent, to which Yusuke is fine with because he was going to quit anyway. Then Koenma conveys that this will be their last interaction for a long time. This brings an end to their extended business relationship and closes the book on their friendship until the day comes when it's time for Yusuke to truly move on to the next life. It's weirdly sobering to think about the reality of that one comment. Before Yusuke makes his exit from Demon World, he goes to visit Ryzen's tomb one final time. 
The two have a brief conversation that genuinely makes me wish we'd actually gotten some interactions between the two aside from their very first conversation upon Yusuke's arrival, and then their final conversation before Ryzen's departure. The two have remarkable chemistry and bounce off of each other's snarky attitudes with ease. Even with the lack of supporting material, this scene still works thanks to the tone, the script, the music, and the direction. I honestly would have loved to watch these two form an actual familial bond before Ryzen's death. Family could have easily been worked into the themes of this arc. For Hiei, it's already there with the community he was born into but rejected by. For Karama, had we taken a deeper dive into his past with Yomi, it could have been about the family of bandits they built or it could have also been about creating additional conflict between Karama and Yomi by introducing Shura earlier. And with Yusuke's relationship to Ryzen, it could have been about the family he never knew he had. All of that could have boiled down to the idea of the family you choose, which is the bond tying Team Yurameshi together. There's a well-known saying that I think could have been the bedrock of this entire arc, which is, blood is thicker than water. That's the saying everyone is the most familiar with, but what you might not know is that it's an abbreviated version of the full saying, which actually has the exact opposite meaning to what most people generally believe it to be. The full saying is, the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. In very simple terms, this means that the bonds you make by choice are stronger than the bonds assigned to you by birth. There are already so many avenues in which this arc could have explored this theme, and I do think it would have been the perfect capstone to the story, especially with Tagashi wanting to deconstruct the characters to try to offset his increasing sense of burnout. This brings us to the finale of the series, which opens with Kuwabara and Karama chatting about the outcome of the Demon World Tournament while waiting for a train. Kuwabara voices his disbelief that it's already been two years since he's spoken to Yusuke, even admitting that he misses him. Through their conversation, we're informed that during Karama's return trips to check in on his family, he'd also been keeping Kuwabara up to speed on how things were going. The episode then very briefly swings over to Keiko after Kuwabara mentions that he's surprised she hasn't left Yusuke yet. Keiko's friends think she's single and just waiting for the perfect guy to come along, mentioning potentially having standards that are too high. This is our confirmation that despite the tough and lonely position it put her in, Keiko once again placed her faith in Yusuke and decided to wait for him to return while likely curving every guy that came her way off screen. It really hammers home just how dedicated Keiko is and just how much she cares about Yusuke to place an entire portion of her life on hold without anything other than Yusuke's word that he'd be back. Back with Kurama and Kuwabara, Kuwabara rehashes a few details from Chapter Black regarding the Kakai Barrier, and then justifiably asks how Kurama, as powerful as he is, has been able to just come and go as he pleases. And Kurama gives it to him straight. <sighs> it's because Spirit World has brought down the barrier between the two worlds. Oh, okay. Well, that makes sense. What? What the fuck? Shizuru joins them as Kurama explains that all houses of Demon World have entered into an honor agreement forbidding their people from doing harm in Human World. Neither Kuwabara nor Shizuru seem all that enthused about this quote-unquote honor code, and yeah, I wouldn't be either. It's a paper-thin and very convenient explanation, but the story needs to end and Tagashi could really use a nap. Keiko also shows up and that's when we're told that the four of them had been asked by Genkai to come to her compound. Along the way, and much to the amusement of the characters, we see that Hiei has somehow ended up in a conspiracy section of a newspaper Shizuru was reading. Kurama explains that Hiei is part of a Demon World patrol that locates humans who have accidentally stumbled into Demon World. This group collects those humans and safely returns them to Human World, usually without any memory of Demon World. The patrol team was put in place by Enki after winning the tournament, and those who lost became the first rotation of patrollers. After one of Makuro's former subordinates remarks that Enki was strong but that Makuro should have beaten him, the previous second-in-command, Kirin, states that she seemed to only have half her strength at best during her battle. He says that when she's filled with hatred, Makuro's power is nearly unmatched, but something changed during the tournament. Due to that change, they likely won't see her at full power any time in the foreseeable future. We as the audience know that this is because of Hiei's words and gift of destroying her shackles. After their conversation, Hiei returns to a room where Makuro is resting and waiting for him. It's not a stretch at all to assume they share this room and some sort of intimate connection, if even in their own bizarre way. After arriving at Genkai's place, Yukina, Botan, and Koenma also end up joining the group as Genkai gets down to business. The last few years, along with all the craziness that happened during that time, including, you know, being murdered by her former lover, has had Genkai thinking about the legacy she'll be leaving behind when death actually sticks. And as such, she wants to give the group an understanding of what to do after she passes away. Genkai declares that she intends to leave her entire estate to their group, and asks them to turn it into a safe haven for apparitions as humans and demons slowly begin to learn to live together with the absence of the Kakai barrier. Considering how far removed from civilization her temple is, it's an ideal place for the kind of space she's asking the group to turn it into. 
On their way out, Kuwabara takes some time to just remember how far he's come and how wild the ride has been as he stands on the steps leading up to Genkai's place. Standing on these steps is nostalgic for him, since walking up them is what led him to becoming so entwined with Yusuke's career. In Kuwabara's own way, he summarizes how fans of the show feel in this moment, regardless of what your opinion of the Three Kings arc is. This treaty sounds great, but it means that's all over. We gotta move on. It's just, it's just hard to believe. True. But when we need to, as you just have, we can remember. The crew goes on to a nearby beach where Keiko finally seems like waiting for Yusuke has become too much to bear and starts shouting her feelings out into the sunset. Her venting is interrupted by Yusuke himself, who's actually back a year early. Their reunion sets off the final sequence of the series proper, with everyone enjoying the beach as well as the return of their friend. It's pretty wholesome, but it kind of bums me out that it's the very end of the episode. I wanted to see more of Yusuke interacting with the people he hasn't seen for years, specifically Kuwabara and Genkai. I think it would have been much more valuable to get an entire episode of that happening rather than Yusuke showing up at the very end. At any rate, we're treated to a full rendition of Smile Bomb as the credits roll over the reunion. We also get a glimpse of Hiei chilling in a tree, Genkai relaxing with Pooh, Koenma doing paperwork, and George probably wishing he had a different job. Okay, I've mentioned it several times, and now that we're through the meat of this video, I can take a bit of time to poke and prod at something that bothers me. I mean, there's a lot that bothers me, but this is something that I think breaks the illusion once you start pulling back the layers and its implications, and that thing is power creep. For those of you who might not know, power creep is a blanket term that describes the gradual unbalancing of a power system or structure as new elements or mechanics are introduced to it. It's present in all kinds of mediums, from trading card games, to mobile gacha games, to even comic books and anime. One of the easiest examples of power creep in the anime world is the Dragon Ball series. As new mechanics and power sets were added, typically to Goku and Vegeta, everyone else became both less effective as the threat levels needed to keep pace with the main duo, and less relevant as they lacked the agency to move the story forward on their own in any meaningful capacity. Power creep is incredibly difficult to course correct from a narrative perspective because you either have to raise the floor for those struggling to keep up, or lower the ceiling for those rocketing ahead of everyone else. Then you have to find a way to justify whichever choice you made, running the risk of annoying or even losing fans if you don't stick the landing. The Three Kings ends up folding under the weight of this upward tick in power, and part of that I'm sure is due to the introduction of the demon classification system. With Taguro only being an upper B-class demon, you really only have two places to go after that. Chapter Black did a solid job of introducing those letter grades, but never got hung up on them, because the point wasn't that Sensui was this or that, the point was that Sensui was trying to unleash those upper class demons. That by itself was enough of a threat to keep the audience and Team Yurameshi engaged. Though, even Chapter Black begins to slide premonitions of what's to come toward the conclusion of the arc, when not only does Sensui whip out his sacred energy, he successfully 1v3s our boys even after their own power buffs. However, when we get into the Three Kings proper, we're just suddenly inundated with S-Class demons and several who are at the very least upper A-Class. So instantly, the bar is set extremely high, well above Sensui when you consider how easily Ryzen manhandled him. The power creep is so bad that to even allow these characters to function as written, Kuwabara, one of our primary characters, had to be entirely removed from the story. Like I mentioned earlier, Hokushin tells Yusuke that he's considered an S-Class demon, and he's just a side character with all the personality of an uncustomized sim. I love Kuwabara to death, but there is no way in hell he would have been able to keep up with the demons that were introduced in this arc, or even his own friends for that matter. So instead of raising the floor, they benched him. But where things started to really fall apart for me logically was when Kurama and his team decided that they were going to intervene on Yusuke's behalf during the meeting with Yomi. Thematically, this makes sense because they're all Yusuke's friends, but what I get hung up on is the idea that Kurama thought this was a good idea, or at the very least, he never vocalizes that this might actually be a very bad idea. What I mean by this is that Kurama thinks everything through down to the last detail. He considers every possible outcome he can when forming strategies as we've seen and as is pointed out by Yomi himself. So in that vein, Kurama must have genuinely believed that they could handle Yomi if things popped off. Between Yusuke and Hokushin, who are both firmly considered S-Class by this point, Kurama's own strength and strategies, along with the other six demons he recruited, the spirit box must have seen this as enough to overcome the blind man. But if that's the case, if this haphazard group would have been enough to handle one of the three kings, then why is there a power struggle at all? 
A whole ass group of Ryzen's former allies roll into town and with their display of power, get Yomi himself to voice that each of them are nearly on his level. As we see later on, these demons steamroll three of the six of Karama's chosen fighters. Shishi loses to Hokushin, who himself gets easily dunked on by Yusuke. Then Karama goes on to nearly get bodied by Hiei's sloppy seconds in the tournament. Even in his Yoko form, he'd still be 50,000 points weaker than Yusuke. Whatever that means. Yet I'm expected to believe that until Yusuke decided to host a tournament that no one in Enki's entourage thought to intervene in the power struggle of the kings? They could have easily intervened on Ryzen's behalf and ended this conflict centuries ago. Hell, even if they didn't agree with Ryzen's choices, they could have sided with either of the other two. Or they could have attempted to usurp everyone and lay their own claim to Demon World. What I'm saying is that when you consider the very existence of Enki's entourage, it doesn't make any sense for the nearly thousand year conflict to boil down to just three demons. No sense at all. And then those same demons of Enki's entourage participating in the tournament instantly invalidates the very presence of established named characters. We watch Chu, Jin, and the others toil away to get strong enough to pass Yomi's verification process, and Genkai places emphasis on the need for them to increase their base power. So when Yuta comes along with his iPhone to scan them, showing his surprise at everyone being over 120,000, we're being conditioned to understand that this is highly unusual and that this is representative of great strength. But they were careful to use numbers and not the class system because then it would be harder to explain why these fan favorites get their teeth kicked in so easily by a bunch of characters we literally just met. The threat of someone else taking the crown needed to keep pace with the fact that Yusuke has become so strong, and established characters suffer because of that. Chu concedes basically instantly, Jin probably has enough concussions to change his accent entirely, Toya's opponent allows himself to be drained of energy just to give Toya a fighting chance, and everyone else loses off screen or to someone markedly stronger than them. Like Jin's opponent, Saketsu ends up in an 8 hour stalemate with another demon, but if Jin was beaten so quickly and easily, who could possibly go toe to toe with Saketsu for an entire workday? Of course, as I'm sure you saw earlier, it was another of Ryzen's former allies. The power creep was so swift and sharp that the only opponent aside from one of the three kings or Yusuke that could actually fight him was someone else from his own entourage. Once you start to think about the insane level of power demonstrated by these no-names versus the level our established characters are at, including Yomi and Makuro, it begins to fall apart. When a power system in a show is well understood, well established, and follows its own rules, it cheapens the experience to have brand new characters shortcut to the top of the ladder in the 11th hour, completely eclipsing everyone we've watched grow over time. Part of the appeal of a power system is watching characters start at the bottom rung of a ladder and climb their way up through hard work, emotional breakthroughs, and so on. When the main conflict of your final arc is a power struggle between three exceptionally strong demons, it's important to make sure that A, the latter is still conceivably climbable for those lower down to allow them to remain relevant to their peers and the plot, and B, you don't undercut the threat of the ones at the top by introducing a second, taller ladder right next door that already has people chilling on the roof. <laughs> I think it's blatantly obvious that I have a lot of mixed feelings about this arc that tend to lean more heavily towards criticism than praise. The arc overall is almost universally maligned, but it would be disingenuous to write off the many good things it does have going for it, however short-lived or surface level they might have been. A while ago, I asked my subscribers who their favorite of the Three Kings were, and despite his general lack of presence, Ryzen ran away with the vote. Yomi, who I personally thought was the most interesting of the three, was dead last. And that just goes to show that even though we can all mostly agree that the final arc of the show was subpar, that different aspects of it appeal to different people for various reasons. As I say all the time, art is subjective, and this 100% includes our beloved Yu Yu Hakusho. I in no way want to convince you to hate the Three Kings if you enjoy it. I think that's perfectly reasonable, and more power to you. This is more so just me explaining why I don't enjoy it in quite the same way that you might. Criticizing the things we enjoy when those critiques are warranted is a healthy avenue for developing our own standards for what we do and don't enjoy in our respective hobbies. Those standards are what push us towards some franchises and away from others. For example, it's what pushes me towards something like Jujutsu Kaisen, but away from something like Sword Art Online. Simultaneously, for well-adjusted and functional humans, criticizing something you enjoy doesn't negate the love you have for that intellectual property. The second half of The Three Kings doesn't retroactively ruin the rest of the show. It didn't prevent me from getting Yusuke and Kurama tattooed on me, and it didn't stop me from going on to watch Tagashi's next big hit, Hunter x Hunter. All of my criticisms and gripes come from a place of genuine love for the Yu Yu Hakusho IP, because I care about it and wanted to see it end on the high note it deserved. 
Before we come to a close, I want to revisit the letter that Yoshihiro Togashi penned after the serialization of Yu Yu Hakusho ended. I went ahead and did what I always wanted to do. If I ever manage to have a long serialization in Jump, I will end it on my own terms. I knew that Jump dropped a manga after 10 weeks if the reader surveys proved it to be unpopular, and I knew this when I started working for them. The system proved encouraging for me, and I learned a lot by being aware of readers' reactions. But I ended up wanting to draw manga for myself without thinking about anyone's reactions. I don't believe that anything I came up with on this premise will live up to Jump standards, so I will not try. In conclusion, I ended Yu Yu Hakusho because of my own selfishness. I'm sorry. And in a post-serialization interview, he's asked, Your first thoughts at finishing Yu Yu Hakusho? Do you know what Tagashi's reply was? What a relief. I know it's going to sound contradictory when measured against literally everything I've spent this entire video doing, but in the grand scheme of things, I'm glad Tagashi did what he did. I don't believe it's selfish to conclude something of your own creation because it's actively become a burden to your life as well as your physical and mental health. He did what he had to do to claw his way out of a downward spiral that was killing his love of drawing manga. I can understand the guilt he must have felt believing that he's disappointed his audience, but what would you rather have? Tagashi slaving away to those hellish jump deadlines, his health declining and him possibly dying back then? Or giving him the space and time he needed to recalibrate his life and eventually bounce back with another manga that's undeniably a massive success in a way Yu Yu Hakusho never quite was? Say what you want about Hunter x Hunter, I know I do but I'm genuinely grateful that it was the gateway to anime for a lot of new people in the 2010s. It opened the door for a new generation of people to double back and discover Yu Yu Hakusho, or end up shepherded in the direction of franchises that they may not have otherwise discovered. That, to me, is more valuable to the community than me juicing a better ending of a story I love out of a man that was just barely hanging in there at the time. Like I mentioned earlier, Tagashi's health still seems to be in a state of flux even nowadays, and despite how starved they are for content, I'm willing to bet that fans of Hunter x Hunter would rather Tagashi take the time to recalibrate and get healthy again, rather than run the risk of watching their favorite story end prematurely or haphazardly, or worse, Tagashi not being able to finish it on his own terms because he passes away from health complications. And as fantastic as it would have been to see the series get the Full Metal 2003 treatment with an entirely original story at the end, I don't know if the spirit of the characters would have carried through since it wouldn't have been Tagashi's original vision. I'll always love Yu Yu Hakusho, and I guarantee you this won't be the last time I sit through it. I learned a lot from its themes and character arcs that I carry with me to this day. The Three Kings is no different, despite how much I might complain about it. But now I want to ask you guys something. What is it that Yu Yu Hakusho means to you? Or, what are some takeaways that stuck with you over the years? Did you learn any lessons? Did you meet any new friends based on your mutual love of the show? It can be anything that is important to you personally. Tag your comment with Thank You Tagashi and I will feature it at the end of the Three Kings rewrite project. I mean that too. Every single comment that answers this prompt will get featured at the end of that video. I'm looking forward to what you guys have to say, but in the meantime, make sure you hit the like, subscribe, and bell icons so that when that video rolls around, you're ready for it. That about wraps it up for me though. I am glad to be done with video essays for a while, and I'm looking forward to going back to doing shorter content for the month of October. We do still have some Yu Yu Hakusho content we can cover in time, so look forward to that, but in the meantime, if there's any other anime out there that you want to see me talk about, review, or analyze, feel free to leave it in the comments below. Be sure to join the Discord server to keep up to date on news about what's going on with the channel since I'm way more active on there, and I have an entire channel full of the videos I plan or want to do and stuff gets added to that all the time, so check it out if you're interested. Lastly, if you want to support the channel, please consider heading over to the Somewhere Past Never Patreon page where you can pledge for as little as $1 a month. You'll be able to see videos before YouTube, and there are some other fun things I have planned for the future, so be on the lookout for those. The goal is to get to a point where I can do this full time so that I can hire an editor or two and maybe even an additional scriptwriter to help take some of the workload off of me, which would in turn mean more content for you guys on a more frequent basis. In that same vein, and in pursuit of that same goal, I actually intend to start streaming on Twitch sometime this month. I'll let you guys know when that party is going to get started in my next video, which isn't too far off, so be on the lookout. If you made it all the way here, I just want to say thank you for sticking with me on this journey and having the patience to let me do my own thing at my own pace. I genuinely appreciate all of you, and I hope the community continues to grow. Be sure to take care of yourselves and others. I hope your days remain or become Saturnian, and as always, thanks for watching.